Silent Witch the 9C1, a drawer full of treasures. As Earth GT Silent Witch September 28, 2021 5 minutes the morning of the school festival arrived with a situation that could hardly be described as perfect. Monica got up from the bed and took out the coffee pot for the first time in a long time to make a coffee. A cup of coffee was a ritual for Monica to refresh her mind. While blowing on the hot coffee to cool it down, Monica glanced at Nero. Nero was still sleeping in his bed, muffled. It's been so cold lately that Nero, who's sensitive to the cold, has become completely sluggish. When Monica had finished her coffee and changed into her uniform, Nero finally crawled out of bed with a muffled cry. The freezing cold stings. I want to hibernate, you know, it's a lot warmer here than in the mountain cabin. While responding to Nero, Monica opened a drawer in her desk. In the only locked drawer, Monica's treasures were inside. There was a coffee pot, a ribbon and a letter from Lana, a peridot necklace, and her father's book given to her by Felix, Eeg. At first, it was nothing but a coffee pot, but before she knew it, the contents of the drawer had grown considerably, which made Monica feel a little emotional. Ever since I came to this school, I've gained a lot of important things. When she first came to this school, all she cared about were her father's coffee pot and Nero. And yet, right now, there are so many things she doesn't want to lose, so many things she doesn't want to be taken away, so many people she doesn't want to be hurt. I will protect all of them. For I am the Seven Sages, the Silent Witch. Telling yourself that, Monica picked up her favorite ribbon and tied her hair up. Just then, there was a knocking at the window. Opening the window pane, a beautiful woman in a maid uniform, Lynn, fluttered over the window frame and walked in. Good morning, Miss Silent Witch. Good morning, Lynn. Aren't you going to be a little bird today? When Lynn came in through the window, she often disguised herself as a small bird to avoid being spotted. This is rather unusual, Monica wondered, and Lynn nodded her head. Yes, there was something I wanted to deliver. But first, let's discuss our plans for today, Lynn called at a meeting, but there was not much to discuss. It's basically the same as in the chess tournament. Lynn and Nero will disguise themselves as a little bird and a cat, respectively, and mark Felix thoroughly. Monica pretends to be a student as usual, and Louis pretends to be a guest at the school festival and constantly keeps an eye on the school. That's it. Nero looked up at Monica, yawning with attention free. Well, let's not be too rigid and just go about our business as usual. It's a school festival, right? It would be a shame if we didn't enjoy it, Nero. You are absolutely not allowed to take human form today, you understand. Remembering the incident at the chess tournament, Monica gave him a nudge, but Nero looked away and wagged his tail as if to play a fool. Monica scooped Nero up in her arms and stared at him. Nero, all right, all right, I got it. I'll be a good little kitty today, repeating her warning to Nero. Monica glanced at Lynn. Comma you too, Lynn. Please try not to barge in as a human. Yes, today I'm a cute little bird. So long as she persistently nudges them, things should be fine. Maybe. If Nero and Lynn guard his highness thoroughly, they should be able to handle it if it doesn't go too badly. In fact, it would be safer if Felix can hold the barrier magic tool that she improvised. However, she was unable to find the magic tool brooch she had dropped yesterday. Remembering her own carelessness, Monica let out a sigh, and then Lynn said quietly, Miss, Silent Witch. Please enjoy the school festival in moderation so that the second prince will not be suspicious of you. I'm sorry for making it sound like I'm the only one who enjoys it. Please don't mind me. It is quite fun to pretend to be a bird and eavesdrop on human conversations. Oh, and while you're at it, let me give you this. As she said this, Lynn suddenly started flapping the skirt of her mage uniform. Then a white box fell out of her skirt with a thud. What kind of trick did she use to have that kind of setup? As Monica stood in shock, 
Lin held out the box to her at her own pace. I heard that you are planning to borrow a dress from a friend for today's ball. Uh, yeah, Sir Lewis told me. Why didn't she just ask me to provide a dress for her? Well, I guess let me at least prepare your shoes for you. Eh ha ha. Sorry. Monica had a wry smile on her face and opened the box she had received from Lynn. Inside the box was a pair of white shoes with a pretty ribbon attached. Oh, this is so cute. Uh, taking out a pair of shoes, she found a note on the bottom of the box, written in Lewis' familiar handwriting. Give me back my handkerchief, you stupid girl. Comma come to think of it, during the incident of the assassination attempt by Casey, she borrowed a handkerchief from Lewis and forgot to return it afterward. Monica hurriedly opened a drawer, took out a cleaned and ironed handkerchief, and presented it to Lynn. Oh, um, please give this to Lewis, and tell him I'm sorry it took me so long to return this, I did receive it. Now, please accept this instead. Lynn took a small paper package from the pocket of her maid's uniform and held it out to Monica. What is it? Monica wondered as she opened the package and found a handkerchief with beautiful flowers embroidered on it. Did Louis make this? Hmm, I guess not. Wait, I've seen this before. Monica had seen those beautiful embroidery designs before. Comma Casey, your handkerchief is so beautiful. Haha, -ha, thanks. I embroidered this myself, eh? You made all these detail patterns by yourself, I'm good at embroidery. I am going to make some for the bazaar at the school festival. Do you want me to make one for you, too, eh? But I, feel free, no pressure. As Monica clutched the handkerchief as she lowered her face down, Lynn said plainly with a blank expression. The giver said to be anonymous, this is just me talking to myself. But, she was shoveling the snow with so much enthusiasm, it's just like her. Monica stared at the handkerchief with a crying smile on her face. There are so many colors of flower embroidery. But among them, yellow flowers are the most common. Comma yellow flowers are a symbol of happiness in my hometown. We also give yellow flowers to brides. The bright smile on Casey's face as she said those words came to mind. I've got another treasure. With a girlish smile on her innocent face, Monica hugged her brand new shoes and embroidered handkerchief to her chest with a heart full of happiness. The 9C2, Flower Ornament Azareth GT Silent which October 2nd, 2021 7 minutes below the clear, pleasant blue color stretched across the sky. Dozen people from noble families disembarked one after another from the carriages after arrived at the perimeter of Sarandia Academy before their passing through the gate. As Monica watched the scene from the window of the school building, she clenched her fists in tension. Finally, the school festival had begun. When it comes to the day of the school festival, Minerva has a strong image of students running around busily. But Sarandia Academy's festival has a completely different atmosphere, especially since it's a school for the children of noble families. Sarandia Academy mainly held several events such as exhibitions, research presentations, musical performances, shows, plays, etc. But since the servants handle most of the behind-the-scenes work and chores, the students who are not involved in the actual stages and presentations usually have much free time. So, what do the other students who are not on stage do? They entertain the guests. Those who had family members visiting were enjoying family time together after being away for a long time, while those who were thinking of serving the royal family were busy promoting themselves. Monica, who had nothing to do with either of them was currently following Felix in his inspection route, keeping a certain distance between them in case of emergency. She had a general idea where Felix's inspection route would be, so all she had to do was to avoid being in his sight as much as possible while remaining alert to her surroundings. As she walked down the hallway, she saw Felix entering the classroom ahead of her. Apparently, he was inspecting the Historical Society's exhibit. Peeking quietly into the classroom, she discovered that Felix was chatting with several nobles. 
Entertaining the guests was also his job. Guess he'll be in this classroom for a while now. She didn't want to accidentally bump into Felix when he came out of the classroom, so she stayed in one corner of the hallway and pretended to look at the exhibits. The walls were covered with posters of plays that will be taking place in the outdoor theater. After all, it was the highlight of the school festival. Virtually all the students in the school would come to see this play. Of course, Felix would be there to watch the play from a special seat. I still have plenty of time before the play starting, maybe I should check around the stage for anything suspicious. Excuse me, are you Miss Monica Norton? A voice came out suddenly from behind her, making Monica's shoulders jolt. Monica turned around, wondering who exactly it was, but then her eyes widened to the limit. Standing behind Monica was a young man with a large build, black hair, black eyes to match which exuded a dignified air. It was Roberto Vinkel, a student from the Temple, whom Monica had played against in a chess tournament and who had asked her for her engagement based on chess. The school festival at Sirandia Academy generally requires an invitation. Without it, they cannot attend the festival. So, why was he here? Roberto looked closely at Monica's flabbergasted face and nodded his head as if he was convinced of something. I knew it, you are Miss Monica. Your vibe is different from the last time I saw you, so I was wondering what I would do if I mistook you for someone else, come to think of it. On the day of the chess tournament, she wore makeup and had a different hairstyle. It was natural that Roberto, who didn't know the usual Monica, would be confused. I think your outfit today also looks good, it's quite fresh and clean, T thank you. Monica gave an awkward laugh and took a step back. But behind her was a wall with posters on it. Which is why her thin back easily hit the wall. As Monica tried to move away, Roberto took a step closer with a big stride. I really wanted to see you again, so I forced myself to accompany my teacher as his entourage. Generally, the invitations were also distributed to the teachers at the neighboring schools. After all this time, Monica realized that there was a possibility that Minerva's teachers and professors she knew were coming, and the fact made her pale quickly. I, I knew I should have asked Lana to do my makeup. Lana had promised to help her with the dress and some makeup for the ball in the evening. But she felt bad if she also asks her help during the morning festival and refrained from doing so. Now she regretted it. As Monica was holding her head inwardly, Roberto took another step closer. Monica's body began to tremble as she realized how close they were, too close for mere acquaintances to be talking face to face. She felt like a cornered little animal. Have you given any thought to my proposal the other day? WWWW which proposal? An engagement, of course, she hadn't given any thought to it. Her whole day during the chess tournament was filled with thoughts of how to deal with when encountering Barney and guarding Felix. To be honest, she had almost forgotten about Roberto. I I. I don't intend to get an engagement, so, if there are any inconveniences, please don't hesitate to let me know. I will take care of it to the best of my ability. I will do everything in my power to make you happy, there was no way she could say. I'm the seven sages in infiltration, so I can't get engaged or anything. To the mumbling Monica, Roberta urged her to be as honest as she could be. I've never seen anyone play chess like you, and Professor Redding told me that you've just started playing chess. If that's the case, then you have a lot of room to grow. Why don't you join me in my quest to become a better chess player? For Monica, although chess is fun. It's only a part of her elective course. She has no plans to dedicate her life to it. B but. I I, what should she say to convince Roberto to back off? But she had a feeling that no matter what she said, she would be forcefully debunked. The tension and confusion made Monica's blood run cold as her eyes began to moisten. She knew that Roberto had no ill intentions, but for Monica, who was bad at facing people, the intimidating Roberto was very frightening. 
The large figure standing in front of her overlapped with her uncle's figure from the past. The figure of a large person looking down at her where he swung his fist down. Scary, 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 scary. Just as she was about to unconsciously protect her head with her hand, she heard someone's footsteps. Roberto Vinkel. Professor Redding's been looking for you near the school gate. When Monica looked toward the voice, out of the corner of her eye she saw a person with stunning platinum blonde with deep blue eyes approaching swiftly towards them. It was Cyril Ashley, the vice president of the student council. Cyril stepped in between Roberto and Monica before looking coldly at Roberto. Treasurer Norton is a member of the student council and is very busy during the school festival. I would appreciate it if you could schedule your personal business for another day. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry, Roberto nodded with a sincere look on his face, gave a formal see you later, and left at a quick pace. As she watched his back, Monica let out a deep breath of relief. If it hadn't been for Cyril, she would have crouched down on the spot. Monica took a few deep breaths to regulate her erratic breathing and then looked up at Cyril. Um. Lord Cyril, Cyril silently stared at Monica. He looked like he was in a bad mood, which made Monica cower. He was probably upset because of all the trouble she had gotten him into. I am sorry, for causing trouble in your busy schedule, Lord Cyril, as expected, Cyril kept looking at Monica's face in silence, but now with his brow wrinkled. As Monica fidgeted restlessly and kneaded her fingers, Cyril suddenly held out one hand in front of Monica. In his hand, he held a white rose with a blue ribbon as a flower ornament. Monica rounded her eyes and looked alternately at Cyril's face and the flower ornament, but for some reason, Cyril looked away and said, Wear this on your clothes somewhere? A flower? Come to think of it, I saw other people wearing them, too. Monica had noticed here and there that mainly female students were wearing flower ornaments in their hair or on the chest of their uniforms. Were this a part of the school festival events? When Monica looked at the flower ornament curiously, Cyril appeared a little surprised. What, you haven't heard of flower ornament, is this some kind of event? Well, it's fine if you haven't, Cyril said plainly when Monica tilted her head. But in the meantime, his gaze wandered restlessly to his feet. Looking at his behavior, which for some reason looked nervous, Monica couldn't help but widen her eyes, but then saw Cyril lifted his slender chin as he usually did and pointed to the flower ornament. It's a charm that will prevent you from getting disgraced for today. You should wear it on when you go to the ball, T to think this charm has that kind of effect. Monica was impressed by the flower ornament in her hand and looked down at it. The white rose ornament did not seem to have any magic formula in it. This was probably referring to a customary or folkloric charm, not a magic charm. She's not sure what the meaning of this flower ornament was, but it was said that wearing this ornament would save her from getting disgraced for today. What a revolutionary charm! Looking at the flower ornament again, Monica couldn't help but smile at the soft scent emanated from the white roses. What a beautiful flower. Even for her, receiving a flower-like charm like this from someone was a first. Thank you for giving me such a beautiful flower, Lord Cyril. Cyril's mouth lifted slightly when he saw the loosened Monica's face turned into a smile, before giving her a small, satisfied nod. V9C3, that's why you are my eternal rival. As Earth GT silent which October 6, 2021 11 minutes Cyril, who was very busy, seemed to have other work to do and quickly left the area after that. In normal situations, Cyril often accompanied Felix, and this should have been the original plan, perhaps something unexpected had happened? Feeling bad that she couldn't help Cyril. Monica turned her focus back to Felix and saw him left the exhibition classroom accompanied by several nobles. He was apparently leading the nobles to another exhibit class. Miss, Silent Witch. Please be careful not to get too close to the second prince, she was hearing Lynn's voice directly in her ears. 
Probably she's vibrating the sound directly into Monica's eardrums like she did in the Entertainment District. I discovered this during our time in the Entertainment District. The second prince has a very keen instinct towards his pursuer. Fortunately, the place he's heading to seems to be a room with a window, so I can monitor him from the top of the tree. If I see anyone suspicious approaching, I will report it to you, and please keep it at a reasonable distance. Monica was never good at tailing people, and it would be better to follow Lynn's lead here. Otherwise, it would be just another example of what happened in the entertainment district. Ever since the incident at the chess tournament that had happened, the security in the academy had been strengthened, and there were guards posted all over the place. The security was so thorough that it was doubtful that Monica needed to be vigilant. I don't want to get too close to His Highness and cause him to think I'm suspicious. Yeah, I guess I should watch my distance. After confirming that Felix had entered the classroom, Monica moved a short distance away from it. Just then, she caught sight of Lana walking around the corner of the corridor and coming towards her. When Lana noticed Monica, she ran up to her, waving her hand. Upon arriving, she noticed the white rose ornament on Monica's chest, before giving her a meaningful smile. Oh. I see I see, him? Is there something wrong? Yup, I'll make you look even prettier at the ball, so look forward to it. Lana seemed to be enjoying herself. Monica nodded vaguely, not understanding why Lana seemed to be in a good mood, before asking her how she fared herself. Lana, are you done with your final costume check? Yes, everything is perfect. Anyway, my father's carriage should be arriving any minute, so I'm heading out to pick him up. Do you want to come with me? I wish to introduce you to my father, Lana's father, Baron Colette, is said to be an astute merchant who has amassed an enormous fortune. However, since he was not a person who frequented the palace, he must not have known Monica's face. As Monica wondered if it was safe to meet him, Lana's face suddenly tightened. Her eyes narrowed sharply, and her brow wrinkled. Monica followed Lana's gaze, wondering what was going on and let out an awe in a small voice. Standing in front of Lana's line of sight was a student of Minerva's who was once Monica's friend. Barney Jones. Barney looked at Lana and Monica in turn then opened his mouth, lifting his glasses with his fingertips. Oh, you're not wearing makeup today. I guess that's more like you, even though Barney's tone was stinging, she feels it was somewhat awkward. Lana tightened her grip on Monica's hand as she glared at Barney. Monica, let's go, El Lana, wait. Monica was thankful that Lana was concerned about her, but she had something she really wanted to talk to Barney about. After all, she hadn't spoken to Barney since after being attacked by an assassin at the chess tournament a few days ago. There's something I wanted to talk about with Barney. When Monica spoke in a choppy manner, Lana investigated Monica's face with concern. Not wanting to make Lana worried, Monica lifted the edge of her lips awkwardly. I will be fine, if he did something to you, scream as loud as you can and say, these dorky glasses just shoved his face up into my skirt that way, you can socially crush him without using violence. Barney's cheeks twitched when he heard Lana uttering such a disturbing thing in a serious manner. But Monica only gave Lana a wry smile, trying to placate her. Don't worry. I'm fine now. She was still nervous, but even so, right now Monica didn't feel terrified at the idea of facing Barney. It was probably because Lana had shared with her some courage to face Barney. Lana, you should go meet your father. Well, if you say so, Lana nodded reluctantly, stuck her tongue out at Barney, and left. Looking off at the back of her heroic figure, Barney creased the bridge of his nose and muttered. Kama you sure got yourself a pretty dependable friend, don't you? In response to the sarcastic Barney, Monica nodded with a bit of a shy smile. Yet, she's my proud friend. After having his sarcasm passed off that way, Barney let out a bland sigh and shrugged his shoulders. Let's change the place first. 
I don't want to stand around talking in this place, why yeah. I'll take you to a less crowded place. Monica started to walk away, and Barney followed silently behind her. Without any conversation between them. Back in their school days, they used to walk side by side in the corridors of Minerva, talking about trivial things and subjects, but now, the distance between them, the way they don't look at each other, is their current relationship. Such a relationship did make her feel a little sad, but it didn't hurt her heart anymore. Monica led Barney to the backyard where she had previously used to eat lunch alone. People rarely come to this place. I suppose this place does look like something you'd like. I bet you've been eating alone here anyway, haven't you? And not for a while, but it's different now. She has been eating in the cafeteria together with Lana, Claudia, and sometimes with Neil and Glenn. Monica fidgeted around, kneading her fingers, as she glanced at Barney before starting to breach the conversation. Did you come here following your teacher as his associate, Barney? Maybe like what Roberto did, she thought he was accompanying his teacher, but Barney shook his head. No, after what just happened, there is no teacher from Minerva who wanted to come to this year's festival. An incident a few days ago claimed the life of one of Minerva's teachers. And the death of Eugene Pittman has created an uproar in Minerva now. Surely, under such circumstances... It was only natural that Minerva's teachers would not want to participate. Although it was wrong to feel this way, Monica was a little relieved. Because the biggest concern for Monica was bumping into Minerva's teacher, she was familiar with. Come wait. Then how did you manage to be able to attend here? Who do you think I am? I'm a member of the house of Count Ambard. So long I asked the invitation to the school. They should have no reason to refuse my request. All right, Monica may not know much about it, but Barney's family, the house of Count Ambard, is one of the most prominent families in the Riddle Kingdom. Barney was very proud of this fact and used to say her Count Ambard household is, or the like. As she reminisced about this, Barney interrupted her with a somewhat indifferent tone. You said you wanted to talk to me about something, didn't you? Since it's you, you're probably going to say, why didn't you reveal my identity at that time, M.M., after Monica fought off an assassin who was impersonating Eugene Pittman, Barney had hidden Lynn away, gave false information, and told them that he was the one who fought off the assassin so to hide Monica's identity. Because of his lies, Monica's identity was not revealed and she's still able to stay at the school. Comma even so. Barney should have no reason to cover Monica. But Barney answered her question fluently as if he's been prepared this line for a long time. I've been thinking your reason for enrolling in Serendia Academy. At first, I thought you were just doing it for fun, assuming now you are the Seven Sages. But, after remembering about the enrollment of the Second Prince in this Academy, and the incident of an intruder at the chess tournament, it's more plausible to conclude that you've been dispatched to this school to guard the second prince. Monica bit her lip and nodded when Barney stared at her for confirmation. Normally, she should keep this mission a secret, but it was useless trying to fool Barney now. You came to this academy to guard the second prince as your duty as the seventh sage, so it's only natural for a noble of the Riddle Kingdom like myself to help you at that time. And for that reason, I did cover your identity, Lady Everett. Barney especially emphasized his reason for helping her was not because Monica's his friend, but because it's his duty as a noble to help the Seven Sages. He then stared at the now silent Monica before smiling sarcastically. Did it convince you, Lady Everett? Sure enough, Barney never thought of Monica as his friend. He persistently pushed that fact on Monica repeatedly. It was as if he's trying to make her think that way. Probably her words as his friend will not reach Barney anymore. Even then, there was still one thing that she really wanted to ask him. Comma I still have one question, but you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Oh, what would it be? As a member of the House of Count Ambard, I will do my best to answer any question the Seven Sage ask. 
Monica only closed her eyes once in response to Barney's sarcastic remark, but then she opened her eyes, looking straight at him. Comma Barney, why did you participate in the chess tournament? Barney's expression fell when hearing such a sudden question. Monica's been wondering this question ever since she reunited with Barney. Looking back at what happened in Minerva when she's still a student, Barney always ridiculed it as a game for people with so much spare time, and insisted that people who were enrolling in the Magician Training Institute Minerva should use their time to master spell instead. So, when she met Barney and saw him participated in a chess tournament, it really surprised her, albeit in a different way. As if he had been hit with a sore spot, Barney made a bitter face at Monica's question. Looking at his reaction, Monica wondered if she had said something horrible, or if she had heard him again. Um, if you don't want to answer. I'm sorry if I asked you something weird, you see. I'll be dropping out from Minerva soon, eh? The unexpected words made Monica stunned, her lips were half open. Surprisingly, Barney responded to her with a weary smile, a smile that looked like he had given up on something. You see, my brother died in an accident last month. And it's not caused by a conspiracy or assassination or anything like that. He just went for a long ride to show off, but because he's not good at equestrianism, he fell off from his horse and broke his neck, a stupid way to die, as befits him. Monica didn't know any circumstances inside Barney's household. But she had heard that he's the second son of Count Ambard and his brother will inherit the household. That's why Barney, who can't inherit the house, has been studying hard in Minerva to become the Seven Sages and obtain the Count Magician rank which was equal to the Count rank. Now that his brother was dead, as the next line of the successor, he will take over his brother's position to inherit the house. Comma Barney, did you really had given up becoming the Seven Sages? Yeah, in the upcoming winter, I will return to my hometown to concentrate on my studies to become the next Count. And for that reason, as well, I took partake to play in a chess tournament a bit, just because he's born as the second son, his achievement was not recognized, which welling up his anger and his craving for acknowledgement. He's been suppressing his dissatisfaction and squeezed his body very hard to pile up so many achievements to get recognized by others. But what will he think when all those efforts were crumbled in an instant? And becoming the head witch, he had wanted so much ever since his childhood was coming in an unexpected way, surely, he would not be happy about it, or so she thought. To be honest with you, I was relieved. I really was, eh? This way, I could give up my goal to become the Seven Sages, Monica silenced, and Barney, in his deeply weary face, muttered to himself. Actually, maybe for a long time, somewhere in my heart, I've given up on becoming one of the Seven Sages, Barney's words were hard for Monica to believe. Because she had seen Barney's efforts more closely than anyone else. At how hardworking he was and how talented he was. Even many had believed that he would become a first-rate magician in the future. Comma was it because of me, Monica asked in a hushed voice, and Barney gave her a sneer. Either he's mocking Monica for her stupidity, or he himself, or maybe both. That's right. It's all your fault. It's all happened because you mastered the no-chance spell and showed everyone how talented you are. She might have done it to tell how much different her talent was. A talent that I couldn't possibly reach, nor I could possibly dream on, or so I thought. Barney let out a dry laugh and turned his eyes behind his glasses to look at Monica. Even so, you still smiled so innocently at me, hoping to get my praise. I couldn't help but think, are you mocking me no matter how much malice and hatred he laid out? Barney's tone was no longer has any vigor behind it. After all, he had already given up. He had given up on the future he had envisioned for himself as the Seven Sages. You kept saying that I was your friend, but I never intended to make you my friend. Monica had already given up on having Barney's expectation. 
but it still pained her when the memories of him reached out as helping hand to her or when they'd been studying together were denied outright. Even then, Barney spoke to the hanging down Monica. Comma what I want is to have a rival with an equal standing. Monica blinked and slowly lifted her hanging head to look up at Barney. When Barney saw Monica's dumbfounded face, he snorted and laughed in a sarcastic way, just like he always does. As a capable person as I am, sooner or later, I'll make a name for myself as the greatest Count Ambart of all time. Right, I suppose our rank is equal now, isn't it, Count Magician Everett, eh? Uh, um, yes. When Monica nodded vaguely at his change in attitude, Barney folded his arms and smiled haughtily. One day, I'll become a competent count that you'll want to rely on. And when I do, please don't be ashamed to rely on me, Barney said this throwaway line as if he had nothing more to say before turning his back on Monica. Monica and Barney will probably never be friends again. But not all their relationship has been cut. Even after a broken friendship, there are always new relationships that can sprout. Monica bowed her head to Barney's back as he walked away. Comma I deeply thank you for your cooperation in this mission. Lord Barney Jones of the Count of Ambard, Barney stopped, turned his head back at Monica, and smiled. A nostalgic smile as if to say, you're so hopeless without me, as he once did to Monica, who cried, Barney. Help me, that's right. You should be thanking me for the rest of your life. V9C4, A Doll Play Azareth GT Silent Witch October 10th, 2021 Nine minutes after parting ways with Barney, Monica headed for the school gate area. When arrived, she soon found Lana standing there, accompanied by a well-dressed middle-aged man. He must be Baron Golette, Lana's father. Monica. Over here. Monica trotted over to Lana, who began to introduce her to her father cheerfully. Monica, this is my father. And father, this is the girl I always mention in my letters. Monica, oh, so you're Monica. Nice to meet you. I'm Baron Colette, Lana's father. Baron Colette smiled amiably at Monica while playing with his mustache. He was a well-built, middle-aged man, and much like Lana. He's also got flaxen hair. He dressed in luxurious but strangely not looked crude. Perhaps he has a knack for matching outfits. Just like his daughter, he's got a sense of style. Monica was nervous, but she tried her best not to sound rude. Um, I've been in Lana's care until now, please don't be. It's also my pleasure to have you as my daughter's friend. Hmm. Baron Colette stroked his chin and looked at Monica with narrowed eyes. The expression on his face was very similar to Lana's when she examined Monica's clothes and hairstyle. I see, she's just like the person I imagine when I read the letter. Indeed, I can picture the bright green colored dress that you wore at 12 would perfectly fit for her. Oh, right, I have already delivered the tailored dress to your room, Lana. You can check it out later. Apparently, Lana had asked her father to tailor a dress for Monica to wear to the ball tonight. Baron Colette looked at his daughter and gave her a rather proud look. The ruffles around the shoulders of that dress were too childish for a girl of her age, weren't they? So, I had the seamstress remove the sleeves to give the upper body a sleek design. But in exchange, I added a large ribbon at the waist and made the ruffles and drapes flow diagonally from there to give it more substance, right, right. Dresses with elaborate drapes are more popular these days, I know right? I think I've done a good job for myself. You can expect a lot from it, I expect no less from my dad, by the way, I've made a ribbon out of leftover fabric. I think that would be lovely to braid it into her hair. That's a wonderful idea. I'll definitely do that. Monica could hardly understand the conversation between Lana and Baron Colette, but it seemed that Baron Colette had made various changes to Lana's second-hand dress. Nevertheless, the excited look on their face when talking about this kind of topic showed that they really are father and daughter. The way Baron Colette looked at her daughter was very gentle. Just by being near him. 
she can feel the deep affection that Baron Colette has for his only daughter. Father. Monica's father, who was unfashionable and socially awkward, might be different from Lana's father. But the gentle look they gave at their daughter was similar. Monica felt nostalgic yet melancholy as she watched the father-daughter exchange quietly. It was decided Monica would watch the outdoor play with Baron Collet and his daughter together. As the play was the main attraction of the festival, most of the chairs were occupied, though there was still some time before the curtain went up. Some of them even were watching from the balconies and windows of the school building. As Monica sat down in an empty seat, she heard Lynn's voice, who was keeping an eye in disguise as a little bird. The second prince has taken his seat. He is seated diagonally in front of you, Monica checked Felix's position, moving only her eyes enough to not be incongruous, and saw Felix had seated in a special seat up ahead along with a group of nobles who seemed to be guests of honor. But Lynn's words didn't stop. Also, about Lord Lewis who'll be mingling with the common people as planned, what about Lewis? He's sat right behind you, Miss, Silent Witch, A. Eh? Someone kicked her chair from behind when she let out a strange yelp. Monica gulped and turned around in horror to find that, just as Lynn had said, Lewis Miller, the barrier magician, was sitting cross-legged right behind her. His wife, Mrs. Rosalie, was also sitting next to him. Lewis gave her a beautiful smile when Monica met his eyes. Pardon me. I seem to have bumped my foot on your chair, and no. It's okay, when Monica turned awkwardly forward, Lana poked Monica's arm and whispered in her ear. Hey, wasn't the person sitting right behind you Lewis Miller the Seven Sage? Uh, well, he's known for his title as the Dragon Slayer, you see. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I never thought I'd see him in person, Lana's voice bounced with excitement. Lewis had been a remarkable magician in the kingdom even before he became one of the Seven Sage because of his outstanding achievements in defeating dragons. In addition to his ability, his beautiful appearance is said to have attracted the attention of various women. If you ask people to name all the Seven Sage, the first or second name that would come up would be Lewis Miller. Incidentally, Monica Everett, the Silent Witch, had the least presence among the seven sages to even get questioned, who's the seventh sage, again in Lana, who kept saying oh my god excitedly, had no idea that the person who was sitting beside her was Lewis' colleague and one of the seven sages. Ugh, why was Lewis sitting right behind me? As Monica held her hurting stomach, she heard Lynn's voice. Incidentally, Lord Lewis had arrived first, ugh. In other words, the kick on her chair earlier was a message from Lewis. Why are you sitting in front of me of all people, you stupid girl? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was a coincidence. I didn't notice Monica stroked her hurting stomach and waited for the play to start. Eventually, the curtain rose on the stage. The play was telling a story about how Ralph, the first king of the Riddle Kingdom established his kingdom. A story where every person in this country has heard at least once. When this land was not yet a kingdom and seven tribes were fighting each other. Ralph, a young man of the Earth tribe, was ordered by Arclade, the spirit king of the Earth, to unite the seven tribes, which he accomplished after a long adventure. At the end of the story, he defeated the dark dragon in the land where dragons live and established the Riddle Kingdom there. The story itself was long, so the play was divided into two parts, the adventures leading up to the unification of the seven tribes, and the final battle against the dragon. The main character, Ralph, was played by a tall, blonde male student. The role was supposed to be played by Felix, but he turned it down because he was too busy working as the student council president. Oh, Lord Ralph, please take me with you. For even though it would be against the laws of my water tribe, I still believed in the ray of light I see in you. The one speaking to the protagonist Ralph was the heroine Amelia, who would later become Ralph's future wife. Her role was played by a somewhat fragile and dainty young lady. 
She had skin that was white as fine porcelain, wheat hair that is soft and fluffy, and large eye that were a pale blue-gray. She was Elian Hyatt, one of the three most beautiful women in the Academy, alongside Bridget and Claudia, or so Lana told Monica in a whisper. Her petite and lavish figure gave a somewhat fleeting impression, which was different from that of the graceful Bridget and the mysterious Claudia. Eventually, the play progressed and the main protagonist, Ralph, united the seven tribes and gained the blessings of the seven spirit kings. However, the more the play went on, the duller the audience's response became, and all of it became apparent as time goes. Not a few of the audience got lost in chatting and laughing, while others had left their seats. Although it was a long play, the script of the play itself was not bad at all. They managed to summarize the long original story very well, and the scenes were easy to understand. The stage setup was elaborate, and the fireworks were gorgeous. Even the old-style costumes were beautifully arranged in a modern style. Comma, however, the characters themselves were lack of impression. The male student who played the main protagonist, Ralph, was reasonably good at acting, but the way he spoke his dialogue was bland. He spoke poorly, and his voice lacked intensity. As a result, he did not reach the public's image of a heroic king. The same can be said for Elian, who played Amelia. Amelia was a strong, noble, and beautiful woman. However, Elian, who played her role, was fragile and delicate, a well-raised young woman you wanted to protect. It's not that Elian was bad at acting, but she was far from the image of the strong and noble Amelia. In other words, it was a complete miscasting. Soon, the first half of the play ended, and the audience applauded. It was not sparse applause, but it also was not because the audience was moved by the performance. The applause came because the son and daughter of a famous noble family performed out a story that everyone knew by heart. Comma I knew it, His Highness should be the one to play Ralph. Comma the role of Queen Amelia should have been played by Lady Bridget. Comma I think Lady Elian would have been better suited to play the priestess role. Comma oh, I wish I could have seen Ralph played by His Highness. Such voices can be heard all over the place. As I thought, His Highness and Lady Bridget are a perfect match. Felix and Bridget, with their gorgeous, good looks, even just sitting side by side were a picture. Above all, Felix's imposing bearing and Bridget's dignified atmosphere both fit the image of Ralph and Amelia perfectly. If those two had been on stage, the quality of the applause would have been different in scale. Monica, there's a little time before the second half of the play. Shall we go get something light to eat? Uh, okay. Monica stood up at Lana's urging and turned her head to look for Felix, but he was completely blended in with the crowd and was nowhere to be seen. Young Lady Elian, it was a wonderful performance, the servants approached Elian as she went backstage. Elian gave a short yay with a somewhat absent-minded expression and pushed the veil she was wearing to the servant. From the top of the stage. She could see the audience clearly. The person she's most fixated on, Felix Ark Ridile, was naturally in her sight. Elian was constantly following Felix with her eyes during the performance. Even when she acted on the scene where she confesses her feelings to Ralph, she turned her head towards him, ignoring the instructions of the director. Felix certainly looked at Elian from the audience, but his eyes only saw Elian as an actor on stage. It was the same look he gave to Ralph and the rest of the cast. He didn't put all his attention just to look at Elian. This is strange. After all, he shall be the one who will eventually become my husband. Elian sighed sadly with a somewhat dreamy expression on her face. I can't allow it to end like this. Lord Felix should only look at me, he should only love me more and more. Elian wanted to perform the play together with Felix so she repeatedly asked the director to make him the main protagonist. Unfortunately, her wish could not be granted. Her wish responded with a curt reason that he was busy with the student council duties. Great uncle said I should be loved more. So, 
Lord Felix should love me even more. He should be. Elian dismissed the servants and went to the edge of the stage alone. At the edge of the stage was a set that resembled a balcony. There was a ladder at the end of the stage, not visible from the audience, which could be climbed to reach the balcony. Elian put her hand on the ladder and chanted a short spell. It's not some kind of complicated spell. Just a little bit of wind spell to make a few cracks in the wooden planks. Eventually, Elian took her hand off the ladder, pulled out the hair ornament from her weak colored hair, and threw it onto the balcony above the stage. Then, when the male student playing Ralph passes by, she let out a scream. Kaya, the male student who acted as Ralph, noticing Elian's scream, immediately rushed over and asked, What's wrong? Elian pointed over the balcony, her eyes moist with tears. A bird, took my hair ornament, and put it on the balcony, oh, well, I'm sure that bird was just playing a trick on you to get your attention, Miss Elian, the boy smiled cheerfully and started to climb the ladder leading to the balcony. He was probably trying to show Elian his good side. However, just as he was about to reach the balcony, a crack appeared in the ladder on which the boy had placed his feet. Ayala, the boy reached out his hand in the air as if to ask for help. But no one grabbed his hand, and his body slammed headlong into the floor. Ilian put her hands on both cheeks and let out a shrill scream. Kaya. Somebody, please come here. V9C5, the hero substitute Azareth GT Silent which October 12th. 2021 six minutes after the first half of the play was over, Baron Colet prompted Lana and Monica to have their lunch without him. Apparently, he had some business to discuss with the attending nobles at the school festival. After all, the seasonal events of the high society in the summer ending and the number of balls dwindling, so the Sarandia school festival has become an important social event for those who have been invited. As for Lana and Monica, they decided to return to the school building to get some light meals. During the school festival, the cafeteria was open to the public, which it's packed with people for the most time. So, to provide a space for light meals and tea parties, the school has opened some of the classrooms. I heard Glenn was helping out in the light meal area, from what he told me, his family owns a butcher store. Will he serve grilled skewers too, I wonder? Shall we go visit his class, M.M.? Since the first half of the play just finished, the school building has been crowded with the audience from the play. Monica, who used to be in a mountain cabin, would have probably gotten nauseous and exhausted in no time. Maybe I've grown up a little. Having Lana next to her was probably one of the reasons why she didn't feel overwhelmed by the crowd. Lana was able to weave her way through the crowds with ease. By following Lana, Monica was able to get through the crowd without much trouble. You walk in crowded places, very well, Lana, is that so? But the local bazaar is even more overwhelming, you know. It's so tightly packed that if I'm not careful, I won't be able to take a single step. Oh, Lana stopped and looked ahead, and Monica followed suit. Ahead of Lana's gaze, Felix was surrounded by several students. The students surrounding Felix looked familiar to Monica. They were the people responsible for directing the play, staging, etc. Lana, who oversaw costumes for the play, tilted her head and asked, What's going on? Then, a girl with glasses who was trying to persuade Felix noticed Lana and waved widely. Miss Lana Collette. You just came in time. As a person in charge of the costumes of the play, Please help me convince His Highness, what's happened, Senior Mabel? When Lana asked skeptically, the bespectacled schoolgirl known as Mabel turned red and spoke rapidly. The student who plays Ralph fell off the stage set and got hurt. He broke his arm and can't continue to play the role. We need someone to replace him. Both Monica and Lana rounded their eyes at Mabel's words. Ralph was the main character of the play. Finding a replacement for him would prove to be difficult. So, the reason they're coming to see His Highness. 
Monica glanced at Felix as she began to grasp what was going on and saw him shrugging his shoulders in a troubled manner. Right, they're begging me to replace him. Now I'm in a bit of a bind, apparently. Felix was not that interested in performing on the stage. However, Mabel was trying her best to persuade Felix in exaggerated gestures. Your Highness. Looking at these circumstances, the only choice I have is to cancel the play or ask your highness to perform on stage. The gods of art will always give me a test, but only if I can overcome this ordeal will I receive the applause I deserve. Mabel, who often went on trips to her own world when it came to art, looked a lot like a certain musician. Felix probably didn't want to cancel the play either. After all, it was the main attraction of the festival. Felix held his chin in his hand and pondered for a moment. Is there anyone else who can fill in the role? Not just anyone can play the main protagonist, Ralph. First, he must be a tall man to match the costume. Secondly, the second half of the play is mainly dragon slaying scenes, despite the lack of dialogue. In other words, he must be physically strong. Third, his voice. This is the most important. In the outdoor stage, the voice does not reverberate as much as in the indoor stage. In other words, he must have a voice that resonates well. Well, given those conditions, it certainly seemed that there was no one more qualified than Felix. Felix had slender long legs, tall, handsome, and physically gifted to the point that he was praised by his teachers in sword art and horseback riding classes. Also, as he was used to speaking in public, he knew how to speak in a way that could be heard by many people. Even though he was not shouting, his voice echoed clearly. Above all, if the country's second prince were to play the role of the first king, that would be enough to boost the excitement of the audience. Monica sneaked an earful to Lana. Oh, um, is it possible to adjust the costume to match the actor? It's difficult. It was originally designed to look good on tall men, so forcing someone to fill the hem would make it look unnatural. In that case, the options were getting very limited. Mabel and the others were desperate not to let Felix slip away at any cost. Their eyes were like those of a snake aiming for its prey. As Monica was perplexed by the tense atmosphere, the door of a nearby classroom rattled open and a voice that ridiculously loud came out. Aya. Oh, yeah. You came, too, Monica, Lana. The spice roast is just about ready. And I recommend the veal stew. The school chef cooked our meat really well, and it tastes so tender and juicy, you have to try it. Glenn who had the sleeves of his uniform rolled up, wearing a bandana on his head and an apron tied to his uniform looked very much out of place as a student at this school. While the students involved in the stage were stunned by the sudden intrusion, Glenn noticed Felix's presence and greeted him with a cheerful smile. Oh, President. Thank you for ordering my family's meat today. My father and mother are both very proud of me. It's like I've done a lifetime's worth of filial piety. Felix smiled graciously at Glenn, who had a big smile on his face. But Monica saw that his eyes narrowed for a moment as he examined Glenn's entire body. He's up to something. I'm glad to hear you feel that way, Dudley. No, I'm really thankful for that, President. Really? Then would you do me a favor, anything you say? When Glenn nodded in reply, Monica inwardly held her head. Oh, you shouldn't, Glenn. You can't just nod at the President's request. Of course, Monica's inner voice did not reach Glenn. Felix gave a beautiful smile and turned to Mabel and the others. I believe the person you need for his replacement was tall, physically strong, and with a strong voice, right, well, yes, I guess he fits the description perfectly, then, so said Felix as he patted Glenn on the shoulder. Well, it's true that Glenn was taller and more physically capable than most boys his age. Not to mention the loudness of his voice. Glenn, not understanding this situation looked at Felix with a blank face. Well, a replacement? For the president? Oh, you mean acting as student council president for a day? 
I have no confidence in my ability to say something wise like president, though, no, it's much easier than that. You are going to slay the dragon and protect the beautiful heroine. Felix's words made Glenn's eyes sparkle. It was as if he was a dog being offered a piece of meat with a bone. Monica swore she could feel the image of his tail wagging around on his back. Slaying the dragons, protecting the heroine, that's awesome. It's so cool, so cool. When Felix recited Glenn's words with a tilt of his head, Glenn clenched his fists and reiterated his remarks. I mean, that's super cool, ah. Uh, Yes, it's cool. After all, you're going to be acting as a hero of this country. So, you'd better tone down your accent, got it? I mean. Yes, sir, the fact that he seemed to believe he had hidden his accent with this was already quite worrying. But Felix saw nothing wrong with it and pushed Glenn toward Mabel and the others. As you can see, he's very eager to do it, I don't know about you. But I'm going to do my best. I mean, I'll do my best. Mabel and the others' faces were colored with anxiety and confusion. They weren't the only ones. It was the same for Lana and Monica. And yet, with a face full of enthusiasm, Glenn said, So, what kind of dragon are we fighting? And so on. And so, with all the tumultuous events of the second half of the stage about to take place, the curtain was about to rise. V9C6, the bluish-gray Malice Azeroth GT Silent which October 16, 2021 10 minutes as you can see, this Glenn Dudley will be acting as the hero, Mabel introduced a friendly-looking young man with golden brown hair to the cast members gathered backstage. My, my, me? Elian, who played the heroine role, showed an ostensible calmness and tilted her head, but the gleam in bluish-gray eyes was darkened. Why is it not Lord Felix? Why is that person not the substitute when I was the heroine? Ah, that's right, this Glenn Dudley guy probably begged them to make him play the hero role. He must be. As Elian was calming herself down by telling herself that, Mabel, the director who had brought Glenn, said as she lifted the rim of her glasses with a grim face. For your information, this Glenn Dudley boy, was recommended directly by His Highness Felix, huh? Elian tried her best to hold back the unladylike voice that almost come out of her mouth. Felix recommended him, another man, to act as Elian's partner? How can such a thing be allowed? Of course, it can't. Felix was supposed to be Elian's partner. It would be unacceptable to assign another man to Elian. Moreover, with a man who looked like he didn't have a shred of decency. I'm Glenn Dudley. I've never done any acting before, but I did a lot of playing Ralph the hero when I was a kid, so I think I can manage it. Everyone in the room wondered about how he could be so confident when he only did was playing the hero in his childhood. Even Elian did think so. The other cast members looked at Glenn with eyes full of uncertainty. Elian would have liked to do the same, but since she had to maintain her upbringing, she spoke to Glenn with a smile that was typical of a dainty young lady. I am Elian Hyatt, I play the role of Amelia. I hope we could work together to bring the best play, you play the Amelia role. Glenn blinked his eyes and turned his gaze down to look at Elian. Seeing him up close like this had shown them how tall his figure was. The smaller Elian had to tilt her head back to look up at him. You seem so different from the cool Amelia I'd imagined. The rest of the cast members froze at Glenn's words. Elian, too, kept her soft smile but the fire of anger quietly lit in her bluish-gray eyes. The heroine, Amelia, was described as a strong, noble, and wise woman. It was understandable why the role of Amelia was not suitable for the somewhat dainty Elian. Even with this problem, Elian was chosen because she was one of the three most beautiful women in the school, while the more important reason was that she's the cousin of Felix Arkridil. To Elian, Duke Crockford was her great-uncle. As the school under the control of Duke Crockford, Elian held the same high position as Felix. Therefore, 
The people around her took this into consideration when they selected Elian to be the heroine. Even Elian was already aware of the fact she didn't make it to the top three at the school secret voting for the role of heroine Amelia which was held before the play. To put it simply, Glenn Dudley's innocent remark had incensed Elian's anger completely. Of course, Elian wouldn't allow her anger to show on her face, instead, she acted modestly like a gentle lady. Admittedly, I am not nearly as good as the great Queen Amelia. Nevertheless, I will do my very best, so I hope we could work together in the play. Keeping up appearances, Elian showed him a beautiful smile on her pretty face. Oh, what a foolish guy. I will prove how mistaken you are to try forcing your way standing on this stage with me. While sharpening the blade of malice in her mind. While we're at it. Why not take a special seat and watch Dudley's valiant performance, so said Felix and brought Monica to the special seat where he had been sitting in the first half of the play. W. Ought I will be scolded if I sit in this seat, you're also a member of our student council. So, there's nothing wrong with that. For the record, Lana had gone backstage to fine-tune the costumes. She said the work would probably take until the last minute so it would be difficult for her to come back to the audience seat. This meant that Monica would be sitting next to Felix, watching Glenn perform on stage. Doubly as bad for her heart. As Monica was holding her stomach, Felix turned his attention to the white rose ornament on Monica's chest. That flower ornament, did Cyril give it to you, by any chance? Oh oh, yes. He said it was a charm that would save me from embarrassment for the rest of the day. When Monica nodded her head as she answered, Felix, blinked in surprise. Is that so? So, Cyril said that. Well, it is very like him. I guess, Felix mused to himself and stared at Monica's neck for some reason. When she saw that his eyes were scrutinized a little bit, well, really a little bit, as if he was unhappy. Monica unconsciously put her hand on her neck. You up? Uh, you um? Oh, yes, will Glenn, be okay? The way she tried to change the topic might be sounded a bit forced. Nevertheless, she did indeed feel curious about Glenn. Monica's mind wandered to the ballroom dance class where she first met Glenn. The memory of Glenn saying, I've never done it before, but I will manage it somehow as he cheerfully dancing in a circle together felt so nostalgic in her mind. She honestly can't imagine this play, will be ended well. But Felix didn't seem to be particularly worried. In fact, he seemed to be somewhat enjoying it. Hmm, I think he'll be okay. You can see he's got some guts. I guess that's a disciple of a renowned magician for you. Huh. Monica knew that Glenn was an apprentice magician but she had never heard of him being the apprentice of a renowned magician. Come to think of it. I heard that Glenn came to this school at the behest of his master. But who exactly was a magician that Felix refers to as renowned? Monica tried to vaguely picture the high-ranking magicians she knew in her mind, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. Why did Glenn's master choose Serendia Academy in the first place? when a disciple of a renowned magician would normally enter Minerva. As she was absent-mindedly thinking about this, fireworks went off to signal the start of the play. A student acting as a narrator explained the story so far and that the main protagonist, Ralph, had finally arrived at the Dark Dragon's place. Sounds like they've omitted some of the content, Felix, who had heard the narration, muttered in a whisper. I is that so? Originally, they were supposed to perform the journey all the way up to the Dark Dragon, but they probably cut it down for the play. When the curtain rose, a dragon appeared from the left side of the stage. It was made of paper and cloth pasted on a wooden frame, but the result was well made. Above all, it was large. Inside, several people were moving it. Two figures appeared from the right side of the stage as the roaring cry of the Dark Dragon echoed throughout the hall. The two were the main characters of the play, Ralph, the hero, and Amelia, the heroine. The seven spirit kings have given their blessings to me. Oh, 
dark dragon that brings destructions upon this land. Take this blade of mine the audience, who had been confused by the different actors from the first half, were swept up into the performance the moment they heard the lines. Rather than good acting, Glenn's resonant voice and sharp movements had the capacity to draw the viewer in. Glenn leaped up high and swung his sword down at the dragon. Then, as soon as he landed, he made a horizontal slash in a flash. Felix said in a whisper, His sword may be too big to use in battle, but it looks great on stage. The sword Glenn wielded was a crude sword, the exact opposite of the gracefulness unique to nobles. However, the way his long arms and legs stretched out to slash at the dragon was eye-catching. After the hero Ralph drove the Dark Dragon into a corner with the help of the Spirit King, Dark Dragon mustered all his strength to cast one last spell of fire. To block it, the heroine, Amelia, would create a defensive barrier, and Ralph will pierce the Dark Dragon between its eyes to finish it off. After that, Amelia would run up to Ralph and give him a kiss of blessing, and that was the classic ending. Oh, you wretched human. I shall reduce you to dust with my flames as the dark dragon shook its wings. A burst of sound was heard right in the middle of the dark dragon and Ralph. The explosion was made with gunpowder. As Ralph took a step back, Amelia, who was standing behind him, raised her voice. Lord Ralph. Please pierce the dragon's forehead while I set up a defensive barrier shouting this, Amelia chanted a spell to set up a barrier. Of course, it was supposed to be an act, so it's not a proper chant. However, Monica felt something strange. Wait, that spell should just be an act, right? Not many people can instantly understand the contents of a spell just by listening to its chant. And since the stage and the audience were far apart, normally no one would have noticed. But Monica, who happened to be watching from a special seat, heard and understood the spell that she was chanting. What Elian was uttering was neither meaningless dialogue nor a chant of a defensive barrier. It's a wind magic spell used to attack the enemy. Elian was now standing on a cliff like set on the far right side of the auditorium. During the first half of the play, what had been a balcony was now made of paper and cloth to look like a sheer cliff, and Elian was standing on top of it. Elian was standing on it, looking worriedly at Ralph as he fought off the dragon, but also paying attention to Felix in the audience. She has found out the person next to Felix was not a guest of honor, but a certain female student. Moreover, she's not Bridget Graham, but just another student council member a plain girl named Monica Norton. Why is that dull girl sitting next to Lord Felix? That place belongs to me. Every time Felix spoke to Monica about something in a whisper, Elian's mind was violently distracted. Why would Felix care about a girl like that? Elian was looking at Felix with such sadness. Even though she loves him. Even though she is the one who should be loved by him. I will let her know her place. I will make Felix choose me. The battle between the Dark Dragon and Ralph was now drawing to a climax. To protect Ralph from the attack of the Dark Dragon, Amelia, played by Elian, will cast a defensive barrier. That's what will unfold later. Of course, Elian can't use any barrier spells technique, so she just had to act accordingly. To produce this scene, they will use the most gorgeous fireworks. A firework made using a special kind of gunpowder that produced colored smoke along with the light, and it will be launched at the back of the stage. This will take place in the background as Ralph and the Dark Dragon are just facing each other in the front of the stage. But when Elian performing the act of setting up a defensive barrier, she released her wind spell at the gunpowder. The spell she could use was only a basic one. A spell to create a mass wind and to cut with the wind. Although its power is not high, such wind spells are convenient because it's invisibility. No one watching this play has noticed that Elian was using real magic on stage. The gunpowder device, which had been hit by the massive wind, tumbled to the side of Glenn just before it exploded. This would cause Glenn to be caught in the explosion of that gunpowder. 
It's your fault for making me look like a fool. And so, the exploding gunpowder caused sparks and smoke to spread towards Glenn. Since it was merely for dramatic purposes, it was unlikely that he would be seriously injured. However, he would probably fall on his buttocks in surprise. Or maybe he'd be scared out of his wits. Of course, if Glenn was scared still by the gunpowder, the stage would come to a halt. When that happened, Elian would proudly announce. Come oh, I knew it, you're the fake Lord Ralph. You cannot deceive my eyes. Then following by reaching out your hand to Felix in the audience seats to say. Come a while the real Lord Ralph, as you can see, is over there. This way, Felix would be certain to come on stage. Because Felix would never want the play to be cancelled. The accident of the gunpowder could be assumed to be an accident caused by a servant's carelessness. And when the play which was almost ruined by such an unfortunate accident was successfully performed by Elian's quick thinking, everyone would agree that Elian was a capable woman worthy of Felix. While Glenn Dudley would show his miserable appearance in front of everyone. And she would let Monica Norton know her place who truly deserved to be Felix's side when all she could do was look at Felix getting on stage. With an enraptured, dreamy smile on her pretty face, Elian looked down at Glenn from the top of the made-up cliff. V9C7, the greatest play as Earth GT Silent which October 20th. 2021 6 minutes Elian had miscalculated two things. First, the basic wind spell she had cast not only knocked down the gunpowder but also brought some oxygen into it which had changed pyrotechnics into explosives. Second, she didn't know that the silent witch, the no chant magician, was presented there. When Monica noticed that Elian was casting a wind attack spell on the stage, she instantly decided. She had no idea what Elian was aiming for. In the first place, she was unaware of the pyrotechnics that was set up on the stage. But she could tell that Elian was planning to hurt someone, so Monica followed Elian's gaze. What she was looking at as she uttered the chant was the stage below. Could it be that Elian is targeting Glenn? Judging from her gaze, Monica quickly set up a simple protective barrier around Glenn and her judgment had saved Glenn's life. When the wind spell that Elian cast had caused the small stage fireworks to swell, it had swallowed Glenn within. If Monica hadn't put up a protective barrier, Glenn would have been scorched badly. To those in the audience who didn't know what was going on, these few seconds seemed to be all staged. What they only thought was Amelia's protective barrier had shielded Ralph from the dark dragon's flames. Wow. They didn't only use pyrotechnics, but magic too. To think they would use actual magic, this year's play is really something. While the audiences were leisurely impressed by their performance, Monica was struggled to keep the play proceeding. After all, the danger on the stage was still not over. Unlike fire cast by a spell, pyrotechnics could only produce flares that last for a short time in the air but it's a different story when it latched into something flammable. And there were many flammable things on the stage, such as paper and wood. Monica focused all her attention on extinguishing them. The quickest way to put out the flares is to pour water on it, but that would reveal the spell she cast. Therefore, Monica enclosed all the scattered flares within small barriers. It was the same strategy she used to extinguish the conch flame. After the flares cannot receive enough oxygen inside the barrier, it became smaller and smaller until it was extinguished. As for Felix who was sitting next to Monica, he was looking at the stage with serious eyes. Unaware that the girl next to him was struggling to extinguish the flames on the stage. How many flares do I have to put out remained? At that moment, a high-pitched scream sounded from the right side of the stage. The cliff-like set that Elian was standing on was tilting as one of the pillars supporting the set was on the verge of collapse, charred by the fire. Oh no! If that set collapsed, it would be a disaster. Not only would it injure Elian and Glenn, which were standing on top and beneath the set, it would also injure some audiences nearby. And the moment the set collapsed, 
Monica, tried to set up a protective barrier for the people in the vicinity. However, she could only maintain two barriers at the same time. And there were Glenn, Elaine, and the audience. She didn't have enough hands. In the few seconds that Monica was agonizing over her decision, the situation became even worse. The wind had changed direction and the smoke from the pyrotechnics had temporarily covered the stage. This made it impossible to determine the exact location of Glenn and Elian. On the other side of the smoke, the sound of wood snapping could be heard. There was no time left. Oh, no. I'm not going to make it. Just as Monica turned pale, something burst out through the smoke. It was Glenn holding Elian in his arm. He used flight magic to rescue Elian before flying out of the smoke. The audience was filled with excitement at the rarely seen flight magic. It's my chance. Monica quickly put up a protective barrier to keep the crumbling set from falling into the audience. Fortunately, there was no fire in sight. I I've made it in time. Holding her racing heart over her uniform, Monica secretly wiped the cold sweat from her face. W what has just happened? Elian was just confused as Glenn held her in his arm. She was just trying to surprise Glenn by knocking over a little gunpowder, but the fire from the gunpowder swelled up and scorched part of the set. And what was scorched was the set of cliffs made from a simple wooden platform where Elian had unfortunately been standing on. If the pillar broke, it would naturally collapse. However, just before Elian was thrown to the ground, what was incoming is not the shock of being knocked down into the floor, but a different kind. With a thud sound, her head hit someone's chest and she was carried in his strong arm. She couldn't see anything as the scene in front of her was covered with smoke. But, when she barely opened her eyes as she coughed, what appeared in her sight was a blue sky. Come away, phew. That's almost got me. The voice was so close that it was almost like a whisper. But then, she was realized that she's being carried in Glenn's arm. Moreover, he was carrying her in the air at that. What is this? What just happened? It's dangerous, so please hold me tight, okay? W what are you? I'm just using a flight spell. Still, they've not told me anything about this kind of play. I wish the director would inform me about this beforehand, apparently, Glenn believed that this whole crisis was part of the play. There's no way all of this was staged. The smoke had cleared from the stage, revealing the devastation. The cliff that Elian had been standing on had crumbled into pieces and was scattered across the stage, but fortunately, the damage had not reached the audience. The paper made Dark Dragon was also safe. Looking at this, Elaine secretly patted her chest in relief while Glenn licked his lips. Well, let's finish up here. What? A, hey, I'm going to swoop in a bit, so hold on tight. As he said this, Glenn's body began to dive all the way down toward the stage. Elian was in a panic and clung to Glenn's neck. She was unwilling to cling to such a man, but she had no choice because she could not maintain a stable position unless she did so. This is the end, Black Dragon Ralph's sword pierced the dragon's forehead. The people who had been moving the paper made dragon shouted its dying cry before withdrawing backstage. Thus, the hero King Ralph slew the dark dragon and brought freedom to the land that had been dominated by it as soon as the student acting as the narrator read it out, the audience erupted in excitement. None of the history books mentioned that the hero King Ralph used flight magic. Nevertheless, Glenn's flying magic had a great impact on the play. The applause directed at the stage was nothing compared to the first half. Everyone was absorbed in the stage and gave out cheers. Elian let out a sigh. Then remembered she still had some line remained. In the last scene, Amelia would have given Ralph a compliment and a kiss on the cheek. The idea of giving a kiss to a man who was not Felix, even if it was an act was unpleasant enough for her. Still, she had to do her part. Elian shoved her rising anger and displeasure to the bottom of her stomach and put a beautiful smile on her face. Oh, King Ralph who blessed by the spirits, please allow me to, 
still being held in Glenn's arm, Elian tried to kiss him on the cheek. Of course, she was planned to stop in midway before it touches. But when Elian's lips almost reached his cheek, Glenn quickly tilted his head away, then whispered quietly in the ear of the stunned Elian. You know, you have to save that thing for someone you love. Elian turned her head down, her white cheeks quickly turning rosy. To the audience, it looked as if Elian had turned over in embarrassment. In fact, her body was trembling slightly. However, what was swirling inside Elian was not embarrassment. It was pure anger. You, you, you dare to decline the kiss which I unwillingly give when you're just a substitute? Her seething anger seemed to crackle in the back of her head. You brought humiliation to me. I won't forgive you. I'll never forgive you, Glenn Dudley. During the loud cheers, Elian was quietly igniting the dark flames of her anger. V9 C8, here's come your favorite flight spell. While throwing him out a window, Azareth GT Silent Witch October 24, 2021 Five minutes after the play was over, Felix went backstage and was talking with the person in charge with a grim face. He was probably inquiring about the incident that happened on the stage. As for Monica, she was not sure why Elian had attacked Glenn but concluded that it was not related to the assassins who were trying to kill Felix and so she left it at that. A small yellow bird landed from the sky and perched on Monica's shoulder. It was Lynn, who had been watching from the top of the tree. Excellent work on the firefighting, um, you did notice, yes. I debated whether I should lend my assistance, but I'm not very good at settling things quietly, considering all the things she had done so far, including the dynamic landing method of flight magic. She had done the right thing by not asking Lynn for help. Above all, with Felix sitting next to her, Monica couldn't give Lynn any verbal instructions. Without coordination, working alone would be easier to keep things quiet. While you were working to extinguish the fire, I was keeping an eye out to see if anyone would try to take advantage of the turmoil and harm the second prince, but no one made any suspicious movements. I see. Thanks, nonetheless, she could not afford to let your guard down. The school festival was not over yet. As Monica was telling this to herself, she heard a flurry of noisy footsteps. She turned around and saw Glenn rushing towards her in desperate manner. What happened to the stage crew who had just surrounded him and praised him for a brilliant performance? Comma what's the matter, Glenn, Monica? Please give me some shelter shelter, the not-so-peaceful word made Monica flinch. Glenn was unusually pale and trembling. What had happened to the man who had just been applauded on stage? Um, who are you running from, W? Well, actually, I saw my master watching the play. When she heard Glenn mention his master, Monica recalled Felix's words. According to him, Glenn was an apprentice of a renowned magician. He found out that I broke the no flight magic without supervision rule. I'm totally screwed up this time, he's definitely mad at me, is your master, that's scary, that people so scary. He would even grab me by the head and throw me out the window without a second thought, be but your master, is a magician, right, among his peers, Glenn was a very tall young man. What kind of magician who could grab him and throw him around like that? As Monica imagined his big and muscular master, Glenn looked behind Monica and opened his eyes to the limit. Ah yeah. Ma ma ma. Then a thud sound was heard. It was the sound of a compressed mass of air being slammed into Glenn's head. As Glenn let out a muffled scream and crawled to the ground, a familiar voice sounded from behind Monica. Well, 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 Glenn. How dare you run away when you see your master's face? Could it be, could it be, no way, thought Monica as she turned her head and, as expected, the person she saw standing there was one of the seven sages, Lewis Miller the, barrier magician. Smiling elegantly, Lewis grabbed the groveling Glenn's head with one hand then dragged him to his feet. What he's doing is almost exactly what a thug would do. 
The disparity between his beautiful appearance and his behavior was quite a sight to behold. No wonder Glenn was so frightened. If it was Lewis, he had the strength to grab and throw him with one hand. Moreover, he would not hesitate when doing so. Monica, who understood directly how powerful his grip and arm were and how merciless he was, could not help but shudderingly agreed. Glenn, who had been grabbed in the head, was teary-eyed and rattling off excuses. That flight magic back there was an unavoidable action. If I hadn't used it, I would have been in serious trouble, sure, of course. I don't blame you for your actions on the stage. In contrast to Glenn, who was screaming and crying, Lewis had a very elegant tone. That in turn made things feel rather chilly. Glenn, I heard that you often use flight magic when going to school from home. Flinch H. How did you? I heard about it when I paid my greetings to your parents a while ago. Well, I guess your magic skills must have grown a lot. Putting aside your empty head, Aya. Okanama Walk, have you forgotten about what you did every single day to the wall of my house when using flight magic? Ha, huh, the last parts I voiced it in a low tone and it sounded particularly scary. Monica backed away, watching the exchange between the master and disciple, which was very far from heartwarming. Then, she whispered to the little bird that perched on her shoulder. I, I didn't know Glenn was Lewis' disciple. You're not aware of the master-disciple relationship between Sir Lewis and Sir Glenn. Responding to Lynn's words with nods, Monica then realized one possibility. Um, did Glenn aware? Of my identity, Monica and Glenn were both transferred to Serendia Academy at about the same time. Therefore, it was reasonable to assume that the one who'd sent Glenn to this academy was Lewis. Did he send Glenn to enroll in this academy was to support me, if I may be so bold. Do you think that Sir Glenn is capable of supporting you behind the scenes or performing covert missions? I don't think so, for better or for worse. Glenn Dudley is completely honest and cheerful. According to Sir Lewis, he had made Sir Glenn enrolled in this academy to camouflage your infiltration, and that action had made Felix put his guard up because he think that he was a spy that Lewis Miller put that spy in his surroundings. If Monica enrolled alone, he might have suspected her as Lewis' spy. That's why Lewis sent Glenn to enroll in the academy at the same time as Monica. Naturally. If his disciple, Glenn enrolled in the academy, Felix would put more attention to him, leaving Monica's enrollment less suspicious. In this matter, Sir Glenn doesn't know anything. In other words, Lewis Miller used his disciple as a decoy for a top-secret mission. How heartless he can be. I doubt Sir Glenn can keep your identity and the mission a secret if he's aware of it. So, it's safer to leave out the information for him. I figured, out of the corner of Monica's eye, Glenn, who had been tortured by Lewis, was crying out to MRS. Miller, to ask for help from Lewis' wife and was about to get a tongue lashing from Lewis. If Monica kept staying here, people would think Lewis and she were known to each other. So, she apologized to Glenn in her mind and decided to pretend to be a stranger and leave the place. At any rate. She hoped that Glenn won't be punished that badly. The fact Lewis and Glenn were master, and disciple had surprised her, but inwardly, Monica was so relieved when knowing that Glenn did not know Monica's identity. He did speak friendly to her was not because of her mission, but because he's that kind person he chatted so friendly with her even when he's unaware of her identity. You're my friend. Monica's been wondering if his words were a lie but relieved when realized it's not. If possible, she would like to remain friends with him. I'd better keep my identity secret from him. To her own surprise, Monica found it difficult to let go of her current life. V9C9, it said that the song was passed down from generation to generation and was loved by many people as Earth GT Silent which October 28th. 2021 seven minutes after having Lynn returned to keep an eye on Felix's surroundings, Monica left the outdoor stage. It would look suspicious if she remained there any longer, especially since she was not a member of the stage crew. 
As she approached the school building, Monica saw Elliot and Benjamin. While she was hesitating if she should greet them, Elliot noticed Monica and approached her. Hey, Miss Norton. Have you seen Cyril, Lord Cyril? Well, I met him in the school building just after the festival just started, but I haven't seen him since then. Usually, Vice President Cyril would follow Felix around, or rather, he always sticking close by his side, but today she haven't seen him together. Rather, ever since she had received the ornament, Monica had not seen Cyril in the school building nor on the outdoor play. Elliot furrowed his brow and stroked his chin. I'm not in a hurry, but there is something I need to check with Cyril about before the ball starts. I thought he was working with you, Miss Norton. At Elliot's words, Monica widened her eyes while tilting her head in puzzlement. With me, I mean, you two looked very close to me, huh? But I thought Lord Cyril's more closer to you rather than me. Now it was Elliot's turn that had become amazed at Monica's words. Me and Cyril? You gotta be kidding me. Next to the surprised Elliot, Benjamin clapped his hands as if he had realized something. Oh, right. You were just transferred to this academy recently, Miss Norton. No wonder you don't know how their relationship was last year. Huh. Did Cyril and Elliot treat each other differently last year than they do now? As far as Monica knew, Cyril and Elliot seemed to be close as usual. Rather, Elliot seems to have a relatively relaxed attitude toward Cyril. I thought you two were friends. Friends, really? Please cut me some slack. Elliot frowned as he shook his head. Rather than displeasure, he seemed to be saying that he couldn't stand it. Then, Benjamin explained to the puzzled Monica how their relationship was. You know how Elliot advocates status supremacy, right? He is proud to be a noble, and at the same time, he doesn't like to see the common people stepping into the noble culture. For me, I'm very pleased to see that song made for common people is accepted by the nobles, but he's too hard-headed to accept it, I, I see. Monica also understood that. Elliot does not like the idea of upper-class nobles mixing with middle or lower-class people. Not because he looked down on those in the middle or lower class, but because he thought it best not to encroach on each other's domain in order to do their duty. That's why Elliot disliked Monica and even tried to remove her from the student council. Now, though, he seems to be putting it on hold. Um, but what relation that has to do with Lord Cyril? Vice President Cyril Ashley is the adopted son of Marcus Hyen. Although he's related to them by blood, his father apparently didn't have a peerage. Oh, Monica couldn't believe her ears for a moment. Of all the people Monica met, Cyril was the most noble person she knew. How he displays his dignified manner and his bearing. And how refined when he conducted himself. So, she always thought he's a person born and grown in a noble family. T then, what is his connection with Lady Claudia? Oh, the siblings are not related by blood. Miss Claudia is the only child of Marcus Hyen, and Cyril was adopted to become their heir. Now Monica began to understand their relationship. Cyril was not a noble from born. And Elliot disliked those who have climbed the ladder. Benjamin continued to speak, waving his index finger as if he was conducting. Elliot didn't get along very well with Vice President Ashley who had just risen ranks, more like he was the one who one-sidedly challenged him. Hey, hey, cut me some slack about the old days. Despite his one-sided challenge, Elliot lost the written test. I said stop, dot it. Elliot covered his face with one hand and motion with his other hand. She couldn't imagine the two of them being on bad terms, but she could sort of imagine Elliot picking on Cyril. After all, Monica herself had been subjected to Elliot's verbal attack, telling her to know your place. After losing all competition in written exams, Elliot, in a very immature way, challenged Vice President Ashley to a chess match. At the time, Vice President Ashley was inexperienced in chess and could not compete with Elliot. Then he said, How can you call yourself the Ashley family name if you can't even play chess properly? Hey, 
Can we stop with this conversation? I'm aware that was not very mature of me. Elliot awkwardly tried to make an excuse, but once Benjamin's mouth started to roll, he couldn't be stopped. However, Vice President Ashley is also a very competitive person, so he did not keep quiet. After studying chess hard for almost a month without sleeping, he challenged Elliot to a rematch and got pretty close to beating him, but due to lack of sleep, he collapsed in the middle of the game. In the end, with President intervened, they made up with each other. Both Cyril and Elliot were different in personality, but their pride was equal to each other. It's not hard to imagine that when it comes to a competition, they get fired up and heated up. When Monica nodded approvingly, Elliot expressed his frustration and made an excuse. It's not that I made up with him or anything, it's just that I acknowledged how hardworking he was, and so a passionate friendship is formed. Disputes arising from differences in status. The new harmony that comes from competing and improving each other. Oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. The melodies are pouring in. I can make a song out of this. A new song is about to be born. Elliot looked up to the skies with a sad face at Benjamin, who had tripped into his own world halfway through. I told you, it's not about friendship or anything. Our relationship is just like I treat you, Miss Norton. It's just a temporary truce to see how things go for now. If he makes a mistake, I'm going to point and laugh at him and say, look at that. You former commoner I, I see. Monica was not sure if she understood or not, but what she understood was they were not so close to being called friends. Elliot made a bitter face as he messed up his neatly coiffed amber colored hair. Ah, geez, how did we end up having this conversation? Right. It's your fault, Miss Norton. It's because you mistakenly thought that Cyril and I were friends. I am sorry, however. If someone asks Monica if Elliot and Cyril don't get along, she doesn't think so. Of course, she is not going to say it, because if she did, Elliot would be upset. In fact, Cyril is much closer to you than he is to me, isn't he, Miss Norton? I mean, you two work together a lot, and, didn't you two go around the school festival together today? No, not really, I only saw him this morning. When Monica shook her head, Elliot turned his attention to the flower ornament on Monica's chest. But Cyril gave you that flower ornament, didn't he? How can you tell? Come to think of it, she felt that Felix had said the same thing. As she rolled up the ribbon, wondering if Cyril's name was written somewhere on the flower decoration, Elliot rounded his eyes in amazement. What? You haven't heard of it? Floral ornaments are often matched to the color of the giver's hair and eyes. If the giver's hair color is plain like mine, he might pick a safe choice by choosing a good flower and attaching it to a brown ribbon. In Cyril's case, his hair and eyes quite stand out, so anyone can easily recognize it. I see. Monica looked down at the flower ornament on her chest carefully. The beautiful pure white roses and blue ribbon reminded her of Cyril's platinum blonde hair and deep blue eyes. Suddenly, Monica had an idea. Oh, I understand, so it's that kind of charm. Charm what? Monica recalled a book she had once read in Minerva's library. It is said that in a certain region in the southeastern part of the Riddle Kingdom, it was believed that by wearing a part of another person, one could borrow that person's power. This flower ornament was a derivative of that, Monica thought. If one wears this flower ornament, one can borrow the power of the giver. In other words, it's a charm that allows you to act like that person. Why yeah, that's why Cyril had said that it was a charm to protect her from humiliation, Monica thought to herself. If she could conduct herself as Cyril did, Monica would not disgrace herself at the ball. I'm feeling a little braver now. If I wear this ornament, I might be able to behave in a dignified manner like Lord Cyril. Elliot looked at Monica with a blank look on his face, but then he slowly bent over and held his stomach, his whole body shaking. Um, Lord Howard? D did you get a stomach ache? No, hoo hoo, ho ha ho ha ho ha. No, 
Nothing. Ha <laughs> ha. But, imagining Miss Norton acting like Cyril, what's that? Too funny. I can't stop. I'm dying of laughter. Hoo <laughs> hoo. L. Lord Howard? Lord Howard. Monica was flustered looking at the convulsing like state of Elliot. As Elliot slowly straightened up, he wiped the tears from his droopy eyes then said. As for the matter of me and Cyril being close, I'll put that to rest now. Now I have a good story to make fun of him for. Anyway, that's it. If you see Cyril, please tell him I'm looking for him. I'll be on the first floor of the school building. Oh okay. After giving a curt bow, Monica left the place with a quick pace. Elliot has a small smile on his mouth as he watched Monica's back. Really, not only him, but there's also Cyril or Miss Monica. Why do I only get surrounded by strange people like them, I wonder. Elliot Howard disliked anyone who is not noble to climb over the boundary of their statuses. Nevertheless, it is also true that he can no longer deny everything about those who have climbed up. Still, I'm not a fan of commoner music. If you're going to write a song, make it a classy one, Benjamin. Benjamin did not respond to Elliot's words. After all, he, who was scribbling notes on the ground with a tree branch, had long since tripped into the world of music. V9 C10, he kept sending her an invitation every year. As Earth GT Silent which November 6th, 2021 9 minutes sorry for the long wait zero dot. I got caught up in my work and had many things to get it done. So it might take a while before I could post another chapter. Anyway, here's the chapter. Leaving Elliot and Benjamin, Monica moved to a less crowded area, and after making sure that no one was watching her, she looked up at the tree. Nero, are you up there? Yo. I'm here. Nero climbed down from the tree and jumped on Monica's shoulder. Unlike the small bird Lynn, the cat Nero was heavy to a certain extent when he stood on her shoulder, but it was unavoidable to have a private conversation. Say, Nero, can you use your magic sense to find Lord Cyril? Cyril Ashley has a constitution that absorbs mana in his surrounding. That's why he always carries a brooch that drains excess mana from his body. So the mana concentration around him was a little thick. Monica had hoped that Nero, who was skilled at sensing magic, would be able to find him out, but he wagged his tail with a difficult face. Well, unless he's using magic, finding him would prove a bit difficult. I just can't detect weak mana. But, I can sense it if I get close enough. Then, can I ask you to help me find Lord Cyril? Sure. Did you need something from that chilly guy, smiling wryly at Nero's unwillingness to remember people's names, Monica picked him up in her arms. It was about time her shoulders started to get tired. Lord Howard was looking for Lord Cyril, so I wondered if I could help. You are one busy guy, oh, I've got a response. I felt a little chill mana in that area. It's coming from that big building, dance hall. The dance hall which is the pride of Sarandia Academy was connected to the school building by a corridor. Coincidentally, the current position of Monica and Nero was halfway between the school building and the dance hall. That's probably why Nero was able to sense them. The dance hall has been used for ceremonies and chess tournaments and was also the venue for tonight's ball. It was supposed to be closed now in preparation for the night's ball. But, as a member of the student council, it wouldn't be surprising if he came in and out to help with preparation for the ball, but that job should be Neil's. Why would Cyril be in the dance hall at this time? As Monica cocked her head to the side, Nero tapped Monica's arm. Hey, Monica. I see some suspicious looking woman. Huh, look over there. Like Nero had pointed with his paw, she saw a woman was walking around restlessly. She's a woman with a slim figure and dark brown hair, wore simple clothes and a stole. Probably in her mid-thirties. If this were a city, there would be nothing wrong with the woman's outfit, but it was too incongruous given that this was the school festival ground of Sarandia Academy, where the children of noble families attend. 
Most of the people who come to this invitation-only school festival were either upper-class people or their servants. The woman's outfit did look like neither of them. She's been acting so suspiciously. Oh. That reminds me, you also act nervously when walking through a crowd, yeah, sure, I do act suspiciously when walking through a crowd, but, what Nero said was a fact. After all, she always keep her head down to avoid eye contact with people, walks along the edge of the street, and moved into a shaded area as if she was afraid of large groups of people. If there's a particularly loud crowd, she would hide reflexively thus never reaching her destination. And the way the woman walked was similar to what Monica always does. No matter how you look at it, she looks suspicious. She might be an assassin, even after hearing Nero's insistence, Monica still could not see that woman as an assassin. If she was some kind of assassin, she would have dressed more inconspicuously. And in this kind of place, her plain outfit would only make her presence more stand out and her lowered eyebrows and dark expression made her look rather at a loss. Exactly like Monica in the crowd. Maybe that woman was in some kind of trouble. I, I will try to call her out. It takes a lot of courage for the timid Monica to talk to someone she has never met before. But she felt she just couldn't leave that woman alone. Nero looked up at Monica and smiled happily. I guess you've grown up, haven't you? All right, go on go on. With that, Nero hopped out of Monica's arms and jumped onto a nearby tree. Nero probably wanted her to go alone without asking his help. So Monica clenched her fists and stepped forth. Monica was not very fond of places with many people. She was afraid of crowds. She was afraid of strangers, even until now. Still, Monica wanted to become someone like Lana, who could help someone in a crowded place even if only a little bit. I can do it. I've got Lord Cyril's charm with me. She believed that if it was Cyril, he would lend his hands if he saw the guest in a trouble. After all, I'm also a member of the student council. Monica summoned all her courage to approach the woman and called her out. E excuse me, can I help you with some AI? She bit her tongue. As Monica was depressed by the reality that she was far from Sarah Lashley's imposing presence, the woman looked at Monica in a perplexed manner. She was a plain, simple-looking woman who looked like she could have been anywhere. To put it another way, she was very similar to Monica. The only feature she has was a dot mark near her lips. The woman lowered her eyelashes once hesitantly and asked Monica in a whisper. See Sarah Lashley. D do you know where Sarah Lashley is? Monica widened her eyes at the unexpected name she uttered. Could it be that she was an acquaintance of Cyril's? You um, Lord Cyril is at the main hall, main hall, eh allow me to show you the wea. Uh, she bit her tongue again. The woman was walking with her head down next to Monica, glancing around occasionally and then dropping her gaze awkwardly to her feet again. Monica hesitated. Wondering if she should say something to her, but when she opened her mouth, she closed it, opened it again, then closed it. T this is so awkward. Not quite sure what kind of topic she should talk about in these situations. What would Lana talk about if she was in this kind of situation? Would it be like, that stall looks so lovely, where did you buy it then continued with a topic about her outfits. If it were Felix, he would be. Did you enjoy our school festival or did you watch the stage play while breaching another general topic as he listened for her response? If it were Glenn, well he would please try meats in our store or something like that. She tried to imagine what kind of conversation her acquaintances would make in such a situation, but she didn't feel like she could copy any of them. In the end, she couldn't find any topic to talk about as she fumbled her fingers and the woman who's been glancing at spoke in a whisper. Comma are you a student of this school? Why yes, I am a student here. Her uniform had told her that Monica was a student from this school. But, looking at her skinny petite figure might have given her a different impression or so Monica thought. Hearing Monica's answer, the woman apologized with her downcast eyes. 
S. Sorry for asking a rude question. I know your uniform has told me everything, but, well, it just, you feel different from the other students here. Sure enough, from the bystander's point of view, the commoner Monica attending at Sarandia Academy felt so unusual. Even if she's wearing the same uniform, they will naturally recognize something unusual after watching how she conducts herself. Incidentally, Monica has the title of Count of Magic, which is equivalent to the rank of Count, but she often forgets this fact. Come are you acquaintance with Cyril, why yes. He's always been taking care of me, Monica nodded vigorously, and the woman's gaze wandered somewhat perplexedly. Before turning her light brown eyes down and looking at her feet. Kama have Searles, been acting so overbearing toward, a timid girl like you, and no, leaving Felix aside, not only toward a docile Monica, he acted overbearing mostly toward everyone else. Monica pondered for a while. Indeed, Cyril is a prideful, high-handed man, she even had a thought that what had stood there was the pride itself wearing clothes. The first time she met him, she was suddenly shackled, treated like a rare animal, and got yelled at most times, so it's normal if she felt scared of him. Even so, Monica knew that all these things were not everything about him. I think Lord Cyril is a kind person. He had taught me how to do my works very, very patiently. When I collapsed, he took over all the work for me. Oh and he also secretly gave me some delicious chocolate. The woman opened her eyes in surprise, looking at Monica. Monica puffed out her chest a bit and touched the white rose ornament on her chest with her fingertips. This flower was also given to me by Lord Cyril. He gave me this flower as a charm so that I wouldn't be faced with embarrassment today today. Cyril gave you that. I see. The woman's face contorted for a moment as if she were about to cry. Then she shook her head gently and stopped in her tracks. The main hall where Cyril it was just ahead of them. But the woman stopped and didn't try to go any further. Um, Lord Cyril is in the main hall ahead, no, I think. I still can't face him yet, said the woman as she shook her head slowly, but the face she gave was somewhat calm and relieved. I'm sorry for stopping halfway even after you did show me the way. I it's okay. The woman turned her back to the main hall and started walking away. She stopped midway and looked at Monica. Thank you for calling out to me, a very kind girl. No, um, I'm sorry I can't be of much help. The woman smiled faintly when Monica's gaze darted around shyly. I'm glad I talked to you. If that child could be so kind to a child like you. The last word she muttered was spoken softly to herself, then, the woman started walking again, without looking back to the main hall again. Peeking into the small gap of the door of the main hall she opened, Monica saw Cyril and Neil busily giving instructions to the servants. After all, there are many things to be confirmed before the last minute of the ball, such as the final confirmation of food and drinks, the number of dishes the position of the orchestra, the arrangement of chairs, and so on. As she was wondering if she should call out to him since he seemed so busy, Neil who noticed Monica, called out to her. What's the matter, Miss Norton? Oh, um, I, um, I have a matter to talk to Lord Cyril about. Neil immediately called for Cyril after hearing Monica's hesitant answer. And Cyril stopped checking his list and walked quickly towards Monica. Treasurer Norton. Did some trouble occur at the school building? No, it's not that, it's just Lord Howard was looking for you and wanted you to confirm something before the ball, so he asked me to contact you. He said he would be on the first floor of the school building. Confirmation? Oh, I think he needs me to check for any changes in the orchestra arrangement. Okay, I'll be there soon after I finish checking here. Cyril was really busy. And Monica didn't think it was a good idea to hold him to tag along with her conversation. But she felt she really should tell him about that woman, so while fumbling her fingers, Monica opened her mouth. And, um, just a while ago, I met with a woman guest, apparently, she seems to be looking for you, Lord Cyril, 
looking for me. I'm sorry. I forgot to ask her name, but she has olive-colored hair, right? She also has a mole on her mouth. Cyril, who had been furrowing his brow quizzically, took a short breath and slowly opened his eyes. Where's that woman now? Well, I was with her a while ago, but she said she couldn't see you yet, so she left not a long ago. Cyril's face contorted for a moment at Monica's words. Comma so, she's calm. That small almost inaudible murmur was not meant for Monica to hear. It was more of muttering to himself. Lord Cyril, Monica looked up at him confusedly, and Cyril bowed deeply. Thank you, for escorting my precious guest, V9C11. Sense of discomfort as Earth GT silent which November 18th. 2021 six minutes this year's play unexpectedly turned very well, especially that impactful performance which rarely happens in the play. While most of the audience got that impression, the people behind the scene watched a series of unexpected events ended up in a good way. A sudden gust of wind had knocked over the gunpowder used for the performance, nearly causing a fire. The people behind the scenes had confirmed that the gunpowder device was securely fastened, but when they investigated the scene, they found that the screws had come loose. Fortunately, it didn't become a fire incident, and if Glenn Dudley hadn't been able to use a flight spell, both he and Alien would have been seriously injured. Prince Felix. I was so scared, looked Elian gingerly as a tear welled up on her beautiful face, hoping he'd to comfort her. But, Felix, knowing her very well, had suspected the problem. It's her. He also speculated that she was the cause the main actor who played Raoul was injured. Felix smiled softly at Elian, thinking with cold eyes how foolish her acts had been. Still, the play was a success. Thanks to your and Dudley's excellent performances. You're a perfect representation of the first kin and queen, Ralph and Amelia. Thank you. Oh, where's your hero? I don't see Dudley around. Where did he go? I wonder. Felix brought up Dudley in the conversation and Elian's mood fell in an obvious way. Even when she smiled gracefully, her eyes were not. He felt bad for forcing Glenn Dudley to take the main role but was secretly relieved after seeing the play end up a success. Felix had been aware that Glenn was a disciple of Seven Sages ever since he enrolled in the Academy. For that reason, he had recommended him to act as the main protagonist, believing that even Elian planning on something, he would be able to cope with it. And Glenn, unaware of his reason, has done it better than he expected. Lewis Miller has been sniffing around me recently, so I've been wary of his disciple too, but... I guess he can be so useful sometimes. While having that thought, Felix immediately ordered the stage crew to remove the collapse set. Elaine kept glancing at him, hoping he'd to soothe her. But he was very busy right now. After this, he had to put his attention on the ball dance's preparation and was about to leave, but Elian stopped him. Prince Felix, would you like to have a dance with me at this year's ball? Felix smiled thinly in his heart at the words this year. The words she used every year to invite him to a dance at the ball. It had become something like an annual event. Of course, he can't refuse her. After all, she is a distant cousin of Felix Ark Riddle and also a fiancé candidate nominated by Duke Crockford. Of course. I would gladly accept, replied Felix with his usual faultless response and normally it should be enough to satisfy her. But she's unusually so persistent today. I hope you could give me something, to prove that you had made a promise to me, he didn't need to make a guess to understand. What she wanted was customary of a flower ornament. And she was begging for it. Felix had never participated in this particular event before. With his busy schedule, he has to change his dance partner depending on the situation and sometimes he has to give priority to his important guest. Above all, giving a flower ornament to someone could be taken as a sign that he had decided on a fiancé. Suddenly, a certain girl flashed through Felix's mind. It's Monica with a blue ribbon and white roses adorning her chest. Though timidly, 
She told him that ornament was a charm to save her from embarrassment. Should he tell her the true meaning of that ornament, what kind of face she would make, he wondered. Or rather, what will her reaction be if he gives her an ornament of yellow ribbon with azure roses to invite her to dance? She surely won't be blushed like Elian. Instead, she would turn pale as if on the verge of collapse and shake her head stubbornly as if her head were about to burst, saying, I I I I I I can't, the responsibilities are too much for me to bear, a charm, she said. How cunning of you, Cyril. After all, he was not even allowed to give a rose ornament to someone. His gritting sound from his back teeth could be heard. Oh, no. He can't grit his back teeth too hard or his beautiful smile would be gone. It was not like he's so eager to give someone a rose ornament, but, when he does that, he wants to give it to that girl. I mean, it will be interesting, for sure. After properly dealing with Elian, Felix returned to the school building to complete the final checks before the ball. All that was left to do was to return to the dormitory and prepare his formal dress. Winter was nearing and the sun was setting fast. He could see the evening outside the window was already turning into dusk. Your Highness, someone called him from behind. Turning his head around, he saw someone approaching. He had a feeling he hadn't seen him lately. Now he thought about it, last year Cyril had always stood by Felix's side, saying that he was his bodyguard. Oh. I haven't seen you lately, Cyril. I apologize. There were just so many issues that had to be dealt with. Keep it brief if you have any issues to report. Felix urged him to continue the conversation as he walked and Cyril reported as he walked closely behind Felix. One of the temple's representatives, Roberto Vinkel, he, hearing an unpleasant name, his brows furrowed a little. Is he perhaps looking for Monica again? Initially he only came with Professor Redding as Temple's entourage, even Felix had not expected Roberto would come as Professor Redding's entourage. After all, it's rare for Sarandia Academy to give a person from another school a permit to enter the school grounds. So he had let his guard down. Well, there was no need to fret over it anymore, since even Roberto could not attend the ball. After all, the ball was held only for the students of Sarandia Academy and a few selected guests. Excuse me, Prince Felix, there's a bug on your shoulder, H.M. Before Felix could reach out, Cyril pinched a bug that was perched on Felix's shoulder. It was a small spider in fingernail size, a kind that was not particularly poisonous and could be found anywhere. Cyril tried to throw the spider out, but since it can't settle down in his hand, it ended up hitting the window frame and fell helplessly, which didn't move afterward. What? A spider is an insect with a surprisingly strong life force. Did he throw it so powerful to enough stop its moving? At that time, Felix felt a small sense of discomfort. He excuse me, he heard someone call him out. Then saw Monica rushed over to him clumsily. Monica stopped in front of Felix and Cyril. After stopping her ragged breath, she turned her gaze, not at Felix, but at Cyril. Lord Cyril, can I have a moment, have some trouble occurred, um, there's no trouble, but, there is something important, I have to tell you before the ball, Anne, said Monica awkwardly with her head hanging down as she kneaded her fingers. Then continued with B but it's something only you can do, Lord Cyril, without looking at Felix. Comma Felix wondered why he felt something sear deep in his chest. I understand, let's hear your story, T thank you, B but I can't tell this to another person, so, spoke Monica as she hesitantly tugged Cyril's sleeve to follow her. This was the first time Felix saw Monica pull someone else's sleeve on her own. Comma why does he feel something squeezing hard in his chest? Comma okay, I'll follow you. Your Highness. If you'll excuse me, yeah, Felix replied with the same calmness as always as he watched Monica and Cyril walk away. Monica led Cyril to an empty classroom nearby. The room was not used for the school festival, and there was no one in the room. As the ball was approaching, 
the students started to move to their dormitories to prepare for it. Therefore, there were hardly any students left in the school building itself. Monica took her hand off Cyril's jacket and faced him with her back to the window. The sunset backlighting made it hard for him to see Monica's expression. So, what do you want to talk about, Miss Norton? He caught a glimpse of Monica's face, which was expressionless, just as it was during the chess tournament. As soon as Monica lifted her right hand, a golden cage was formed around Cyril. Come it was a cage made of a lightning spell. Touch it and he'll be in serious trouble. What was the meaning of this, Miss Norton? Lord Cyril never addressed me with Miss Norton nor my full name. He always called me Treasurer Norton spoke the girl who created the lightning cage in an emotionless voice as the man stammered. Let me ask you, who are you, V9C12? More terrible than painful things as Earth GT silent which November 19, 2021 9 minutes. Monica likes it when Cyril addresses her as Treasurer Norton. Because it makes her feel like she's been accepted as one of the student council members. Just because I called you differently, you're treating me like a stranger, said the man who resembled Cyril while glaring at Monica from the inside of the lightning cage. And Monica gave a cold look at him. Comma I suggest you stop impersonating Lord Cyril, that person may look similar to Cyril. And most people might have been deceived by his face, but, Monica who's good at spotting the difference, that trick will not work on her. Just like when she instantly found the imbalance in the ledger, she could recognize that the person in front of her was an imposter. First thing first, there was a slight discrepancy at the portion of his torso. Considering how Monica had a habit to remember a person by the numbers, like the length and thickness of the limbs of people around her, she can't be deceived even he'd skillfully dressed himself some clothes and boots to make it similar. Second. The real Cyril Ashley had a constitution that will always absorb mana around him, so he's constantly releasing mana out of his body by using a brooch magic tool. If he was the same Cyril she met at the hall earlier, she would sense some mana he had released, but she didn't. The brooch he wore had a similar design, but not the kind of a magic tool. And last, comma each person has different shape of ears, after hearing Monica's words. The man cupped his hand on his ear. She couldn't see through his disguise at the chess tournament because she didn't know Eugene Pittman in person. But, if it were someone she knew, Monica was confident she would be able to distinguish it. Also, you might have been able to change your face skillfully with a body manipulation spell. But your modification didn't extend to your ears, a crude work, if I would say said Monica indifferently like cornering her enemy with her move in the chess, and the man's profile changed in an instant. Ha! Ha ha! The lips of the man in front of her slowly lifted up to carve a smile like a crescent moon. The laughter overflowing from his lips was sweet as if honey had been boiled down and burnt. A crude work? Wouldn't a person who remembers even the shape of her acquaintance's ears consider be unusual? That's so creepy. But, as expected of the seven sages, I suppose, noticing her shoulder jolted, the man smiled even deeper and he licked his lips. I was a little doubtful, but I guess I was right. I still can't believe it, to be honest. I didn't expect that Monica Everett of the Silent Witch, one of the seven sages, was such a little girl, she had expected her identity was exposed by that man. After all. There is only one person who could use the no chance spells. After concluding there's no reason for her to hide her identity anymore, she opened her mouth. Kama stop speaking using the face, Nuope. I'd love this face, you know. Just look at this beautiful face, it made me so envious, said the man as he stroked the face which resembled Cyril while sighing like an enraptured person. The gesture felt so uncomfortable. And for some reason, Monica felt so irritated. Kama cease your resistance and surrender yourself, sneaker but I refuse. Still caught inside the lightning cage, the man waved his right sleeve swiftly. What was coming out from it were doses of tiny spiders, 
which were slipping through the gap of the lightning cage, latching on to Monka's face down to the neck. And the expression of Cyril who did that warped into a wicked smile. TL, burn IT with fire ray, Yuan, the man who transformed into Cyril, smiled confidently after assuring his victory was certain. While Monica was preoccupied with the spider he had released from his sleeve, Heidi jumped in as she opened the door. Yuan had made Heidi dressed in Serendia Academy School uniform and had her stand by in the hallway. So when she came, she had finished her chant to launch an attack spell. Just like chess, every move in this battle was fixed. There might be some exceptions, but a magician can only use two spells at the same time. If a knight fights with a sword and shield in his right and left hands, then a magician's tactic is to simultaneously deploy offensive and defensive spells. So while Silent was currently maintaining the lightning cage to trap Yuan with one hand, Yuan, using mana manipulation released spiders from his sleeve to force Silent Witch to use her other hand. And when Silent Witch used both of her hands, she would have no means of preventing Heidi's attack and will be left defenseless and vulnerable to attack. Even she's the no-chant genius magician if they can catch her by surprise when she was maintaining two spells at the same time, they still can defeat her. Pierce through, Ice Spear, Heidi aimed her Ice Spear toward Silent Witch. Unfortunately for her, the current Silent Witch hadn't put any attention to the spiders Yuan had released. Let alone lose consciousness. Most people feel disgusted and disturbed when dozens of spiders were thrown at them while they crawl all over their skin. And he thought a little girl like her would be in tears and panicking. However, Monica Everett of the Silent Witch only glanced at the spider and after confirming it was not poisonous, she did not shake it off her screen but looked at Heidi with a poker face. Then, while maintaining the lightning cage that restrains you on, she cancelled out the ice spear that Heidi released with her fire magic. While ignoring a countless number of spiders cling to her face and neck. Heidi immediately pulled out a hidden knife and attacked Silent Witch. But by the time she took out the knife, Silent Witch had already unleashed her next spell. Heidi. Watch your feet, shouted Yuan who had noticed. But it was too late. Just like a spider web. Silent Witch stretched out a thread of lightning from the lightning cage where Yuan trapped, to ensnare Heidi's feet. Heidi, who was too late to notice, touched the thread of lightning at her feet and collapsed to the floor after her whole body convulsing. Comma ah. Why Yuan? I am sorry, Silent Witch picked up a knife that Heidi dropped, then gazed at both of them expressionlessly. Standing in the center of the thread of lightning that spread out like a spider's web with her face covered with spiders, her image resembled a spider incarnate. Her young, naive face gazed at Yuan and Heidi with a horrifyingly blank expression. It was just like a spider catching a butterfly entangled in its thread to eat it mercilessly. Without changing her expression, Silent which waved her finger. A lightning thread which had been like a spider's web, changed its shape again and became a cage surrounding Heidi. The witch, who had trapped Yuan also successfully restrained Heidi. Like the time when she completely defeated her opponent in a chess tournament. She had shown her opponent, expressionlessly, emotionlessly, and ruthlessly, how overwhelming the difference between their power was. Monica stared silently at the spider crawling on her skin as it lost its strength and fell to the ground with a flop. This spider was just a corpse from the beginning. That man, who was called Yuan, had put magic into the spider's carcass and temporarily controlled it. Monica might haven't seen it, but the spider on Felix's shoulder was also one of these. If it were a normal spider, it wouldn't have died from being thrown at the window. But it fell down because the supply of magic was cut off and turned back into a corpse. If anything, the goal of manipulating a non-poisonous spider could only be for a diversion. And Monica knew that, so she didn't use her magic to get rid of the spiders. Monica quietly brushed off the spider carcass that was still stuck to her skin. Comma spider would never scare me, after all, 
The thing that frightened Monica most is always people. Even the word justice that had no malice would make people trample innocent people or even kill them. To Monica Rain, who has her father taken away from these terrifying people, she was hoping all of them to disappear. To Monica Norton, who had found her precious friend in the Serendia Academy changed her thinking, she wants to protect all these people. And so, Monica Everett made one conclusion. I don't fear spiders nor dragons, but human. It's the most terrifying thing to me. That's why I think I could hurt or even do something worse, is that supposed to be a threat? What do you mean by do something even worse? Are you going to torture me? Cyril sneered at Monica. Is a little girl like her can even bear doing the torture thing, in the first place? In front of that man, Monica formulated a spell. Since Monica didn't imbue her spell with mana, it wouldn't be activated. But, Yuan and Heidi who heard Monica's chant, their complexion changed drastically. Monica was planning to cast the kind spell that banned in the Riddle Kingdom, a mind spell. It was a spell to dominate and control people to your bidding. With that spell, she could make them tell her everything. Struggling a bit, Yuan opened his mouth. Kama hey, hey, should that spell supposed to be forbidden in this country? Among the forbidden books that only the seven sages could read, there was a book that described the mind involving spell. Once you know the theory, it's not hard to reproduce, if Yuan resisted. She would not hesitate to use the forbidden spell. So, if he didn't want to be turned into a vegetable, he should answer her everything, or so Monica threatened. But Yuan raised his head and laughed. Aha, ha ha ha. I thought you're just a little girl, but also a crazy one at that. Hup. To think you could pluck out someone else's life emotionlessly like a chess piece. I guess that's your true nature, am I right? Monica Everett of the Silent Witch, confronted Cyril in Monica's ruthless manner. And maybe what he said was not wrong. Monica, who only sees people as numbers, could hurt people without feeling anything. And she's able to do it. No matter how much she tries to imitate Lana, she will never be able to be like Lana. Even then, as long she could protect people she care about, she would pluck everything that threatened her friends. Even it would make her being called a merciless witch. Kama this is your last chance, tell me your goal, all of it. Hey, silent witch, do you know what the real Cyril is doing right now? The last time Monica saw Cyril was at the ballroom. She has not seen him since then. And Yuan didn't miss it when Monica twitched her shoulder. I had my people monitoring him right now. If anything happens to me, they will kill the owner of this face. Trying to imitate Cyril's manner, Yuan expressed his stubbornness with a smile. Kama you will release this cage for me, right? After a few seconds of conflict in her mind, Monica released the lightning cage. Yuan pushed the defenseless Monica down to the floor, mounted her, and held her wrists. The crueler you can be for someone else, the more that someone else will drag you down. Don't you think that's ironic, even if she can't move right now? Monica still can kill this man. But if Monica harmed this man, Cyril would die. Heidi got up and put a handkerchief soaked in the drug over Monica's mouth. M.M. M.M.M.M. It was the kind of drug that would make a person who smelled its strong odor lose consciousness. Even after trying to hold her breath, a small sniff still made her very dizzy. If her consciousness got more clouded, she would unable to cast spells and the situation will be worsened. Monica tried to resist but the smile on Ewan's face which resembled Cyril's turned more twisted. Then he leaned forward and ran his tongue down Monica's neck as she struggled to hold her breath. MMM. Monica screamed and unconsciously inhaled the drug hard in the spur of the moment. The back of her head went numb and her vision distorted languidly. She can't calculate accurately. The beautiful mathematical formulas that run through her head, the magic formulas, were distorting and collapsing. Comma M.M. M. You unlicked his lips as he watched Monica letting inaudible voices before she stopped her resistance and give in to the drug. You know, 
I am more experienced in doing some cruel thing to people. Now, let's do some cruel thing, shall we? V9C13. No next year for Monica Norton as Earth GT Silent which November 22nd, 2021 10 minutes the more a person has been oppressed and hurt, the more will he understand the pain of others, you know, I hate that person who says that lying the most, looking into Monica's muddled face closely, Yuan shoved his finger into Monica's mouth, then stirred it calmly. Hearing Monica's groan, Yuan's smirk broadened turning it into a crescent moon. But from my understanding, the more a person has been oppressed and hurt, the more he knows how to trample and hurt others. Isn't that the case with you, the human-hating silent witch? His slim fingertips carefully traced her rows of teeth. He then teasingly plucked Monica's small tongue with his fingertips. I guess you didn't hide any self-poison behind your teeth, groan. Monica let out a weak groan and Yuan released his fingers from Monica's tongue. After that, he trailed his finger over Monica's frail body, then continued by stroking up Monica's neck and thin belly as he enjoyed the small shiver she gave each time. Now, I wonder what should I do with her? Since my job is done, you don't mind if I have a little fun with her, do you? Have you confirmed that matters? Yes. Yeah. I've confirmed it at a close range after pretending to be getting rid of a spider from him. It's the work of the traitor Arthur. That person's prediction was right. What were they talking about? That thought raced in Monica's mind as she tried hard to hold in her consciousness. Considering how many times he's got a chance to kill Felix when he approached him, everybody had thought that the goal of the man called Yuan was to assassinate him. Even Monica also did think so. And yet it ended after he's done confirming on some matter. What did he want to confirm to even have taken the trouble and effort to kill Eugene Pittman, took his place, and approached him as Cyril Ashley? Did their goal to approach his highness was truly to confirm on some matters? But, for what reason? Also, who's that Arthur person? With her dulled thought, Monica can't connect all these pieces of information even when she wants to. It's just like scooping water with bare hands, even you could contain it, the clue she had assembled, in the end, will slip away through the fingers gaps? Even so, she's still holding her consciousness, but then Yuan stroked her cheek caressingly. Now, what should I do with this girl? I'd like to teach her various things, from pain to ecstasy, but that person might desire to have her talent on his side. I think feeding her some drug and discipline in between regularly would prove a better choice to make her obey, you're right. It might be troublesome if she puts some resistance later. Let's do your suggestion, well then, I will prepare the drug. Heidi took out a small medicine bottle from her pocket and opened the lid. The drug was different from what she used on the handkerchief earlier, it was more potent and addictive. Once a person ingests the drug. He will be filled with a strong sense of intoxication, but when the drug wears off, he will experience withdrawal symptoms and crave more of the drug. The end result of a person who is addicted to this drug is, a cripple. Monica quickly gritted her teeth and tried to resist. However, with no strength in her mouth, Yuan easily pried it open and Heidi was placing the medicine bottle near Monica's mouth. The thick. Viscous liquid was about to fall into Monica's mouth. And no. Tears welled up in the corners of Monica's eyes, and then, shatter, the window crashed open and a man jumped in. He's a wavy black-haired man with glittering golden eyes, dressed in old-fashioned clothes. In the situation where a bottle of medicine was hanging near her face and the lips of her were wet, Monica let out a faint voice. Net. Ro. Nero who had been transformed into a human, used his inhuman leaping ability to leap from the window frame to Monica at once and mercilessly kicked out at Heidi, who was attempting to drug Monica. Yuan reacted as quickly as he could and pointed his knife at Nero. However, Nero grabbed Yuan's wrist holding the knife and punched him hard in the face with his other hand. Nero lifted Monica up from the floor and sniffed her. His nose immediately noticed the source of the strange smell. It was the drug that Heidi had tried to feed Monica. 
and some small amount of that highly viscous liquid had spilled on Monica's lips. Nero bent down and licked the potion off Monica's lips. Heidi's eyes widened in disbelief when she saw the scene. That drug would rob people's consciousness in one lick. How can you? A drug on this level won't work on me. Nero snorted as he glared at Heidi and Yuan while holding Monica tightly. You lowly human, how dare you to hurt my master? I hope you're prepared to be shredded without leaving a speck of single dust, spoke Nero as he let out a deep hissing sound like a lizard. His transformation was almost released because of his anger. And his skin, which had taken on the appearance of a human, was now overlapped with something black. Both Yuan and Heidi who watched that deformed figure can't utter any word. At that moment, a voice that could only be heard by Nero and Monica resonated directly in their eardrums. It was Lin. Sir Nero, we have yet to confirm Cyril's safety. And Sir Lewis is still swearingly looking for him at the moment. So, please endure it for a while longer. Lin must have been listening to all their conversations in this classroom. Moreover, she also coordinated with Lewis to find Cyril. Unfortunately, Nero couldn't care less about Lin and Lewis' circumstances. I don't want to. Besides Monica, I don't care what will happen to other humans. Nero's golden pupils narrowed into vertical slits which were impossible for humans. And that inhuman gaze was preying upon both Heidi and Yuan. I have no interest in both of you and I won't listen to your pleading. So, die, inside his vicious mouth were glaringly sharp teeth. Holding Monica in one hand, Nero bent forward and rushed over on Yuan, then grabbed his face using his other hand. But Nero furrowed his brows after getting an unpleasant feeling when Yuan's head almost touched the wall behind. What's this? The feeling when his fingers dug into Yuan's face was like grabbing clay. Nero released his grasping and Yuan put his hands on his warped face. There was no longer any trace of Cyril Ashley's face on his face. Aw, oh, you're so mean. Sculpting this face is not easy, you know. His warped lips had made his voice sound distorted. As if patching skins onto his skull, he needed his face to arrange his distorted skin with both of his hands. When he's done, what appeared there was not the face they knew. Monica couldn't tell if that flat face which was not common in this country, belonging to Yuan himself or a stranger's face. What was that? It's so gooey and it's so gross, but when Nero was planning to crush the newly appeared Yuan's face, Monica managed to squeeze her voice out of her half-dazed consciousness. Come and Nero, be careful, he's using a body modification spell. A body modification spell is a spell to strengthen or manipulate the body by pouring mana into it. However, because of the side effect of mana poisoning, its usage was forbidden in this country. Monica had read a book about body modification spell that was available within the Seven Sages Authority. According to it, the spell can only be used on the skin to stop bleeding or remove an old scar. I've never seen or heard a spell that can manipulate the shape of a face at will. When Nero saw Yuan was using a spell that was out of their understanding, he knew he can't let his guard down. So he stopped his attempt and watched closely at Yuan's and Heidi's movements, especially at Yuan's body modification spell. On the other hand, Yuan and Heidi didn't try to attack right away. They must have realized that Nero was not an ordinary person. They were on alert and searching for a way to get out of this situation. So Yuan approached a new proposal. Hey, dark-haired guy. Wanna make a deal with me? I'll give you the antidote of that drug for that silent witch, but in exchange, will you let us go, said Yuan as he took a small bottle from his pocket, flashing it toward Nero. But what appeared on Nero's face was only a vicious smile. I only make a deal with someone I acknowledged. If you have the antidote, I just have to take it by force and kill you. Oh, I'm so scattered I will do this. Then the small bottle slipped off from his hand. It fell and broke after hitting the floor and the liquid inside scattered across. In an instant, the classroom was filled with white smoke. 
It had a pungent smell which was probably some kind of poison. For your information, Heidi and I have some resistance toward poisons, so this smoke won't affect us, but what about her? I guess it will be painful for her. Common Nero immediately turned his gaze toward Monica in his hand. Unlike Nero who's had resistance toward poisons, Monica's resistance was the same as a normal human. Especially when she had been subjected to another drug, so taking any other poison would only worsen her condition. Maybe because she had inhaled some smoke, she was writhing, scratching her throat in agony. Nero clicked his tongue and jumped out the window to escape from the poisonous smoke while Yuan's high-pitched laugh echoed at his back. Farewell, Silent Witch, and you too, Mr. Knight. I hope you find the horrible truth shrouding around us, if that happens, let's meet again in the future. Nero carried Monica to the old garden which was less crowded. As the day ended and the sun had already set more than halfway, the night breeze blew in the garden. Nero wrapped Monica's body in his robe, sat down by the broken fountain. Then, a yellow bird came down and transformed into a beautiful maid. Lindbergh Field, a contracted spirit of Lewis Miller, placed her hand on the ragged breathing Monica's mouth. I supplied her some clean oxygen to ease her breathing, will it restore Monica's condition? Nero stared at Lind doubtfully to which she responded with a shook. It can only aid her breathing not curing her poison. From her condition, she was not afflicted with a strong poison. The effect of the poison should be gone after resting for a half day and she will back to normal. While Lynn was giving Nero an explanation, Monica weakly opened her eyes to ask her. Kama Lynn, H have you found? Cyril, we've taken him in our care. The case if he had another comrade might only a blah, H how? Is His Highness escorting? No problem. It's been handled by Sir Lewis. He's been secretly watching him around very closely while complaining about how cold it is. T then, H have you captured those two? Considering the situation, the best option was to have one of Lewis or Lingard Felix, while the other one is to chase you on and Heidi. Despite being aware that it will let them escape. Lewis still sent Lynn to go to Monica's place instead of chasing them. It was an unusual choice, considering how his behavior was. Sir Lewis ordered me to assist Silent Witch's first priority. He has considered that losing you would prove more damaging than letting the enemies escape. Lewis must be angry, letting the enemies escape. He might appear angry, but I could sense he also worried about you. Ah, that's very Lewis like. Monica regulated her breathing as she gave her a wry smile. Just breathing alone has made her very nauseous at first, but it was much better now. Maybe the poison was not so potent in the first place. After resting for a bit, she should be able to walk again. As Monica shifted her body to see how far she could move, Nero hugged her tightly. With the maid woman here, we can use her flight spell to move you to your attic room. But you have to rest for now. It will be trouble if you collapsed in the midway. No, I have to go. Jelana's room. I need to make a preparation for the ball. Hearing Monica's words, Nero gawked at her. Huh? What can you do with that weak body? Shouted Nero at her and Lynn also nodded in agreement. Please rest assured, you can leave the guarding of the second prince at the ball to us. In the meantime, you should take proper rest, I'm sorry, for making you guard the second prince when it's not your responsibility, but this is my selfish request, in the almost crying state, Monica's face crumpled and she muttered. And I might not be there in the next year's ball, like Yuan had told her. Monica Everett of the silent which treats humans mercilessly. And it was a fact she can't refute. She was a witch who is terrified of human beings. Because of it she can be so cruel toward them and only see them as nothing but numbers. Monica closed her eyes, thinking about all the treasure she had obtained. Lana gave her a letter and a ribbon Felix gave her a necklace Casey gave her a handmade handkerchief even the white rose ornament attached to her chest was given by someone. All of these things were not something they had addressed to Silent Witch. But a gift for a little girl named Monica Norton. 
At some point, she might not be able to part with the identity of Monica Norton and the time she spent as her. Despite being aware that she had lied to everybody. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. At least, please let me be Monica Norton while I'm only at this school. To which person did she apologize? Is it to Lewis who gave her the mission? Is it to Nero and Lynn for the troubles she had caused to them? Or, is it to her friends whom she had lied to? Perhaps it was to all of them. But I still want to be Monica Norton, even only for a little longer. V9C14, preferred type as Earth GT Silent which November 28, 2021 9 minutes after convincing Nero and Lynn to bring her to Lana's room. She met Lana with her eyes widened. Comma you don't seem to be okay. Hey, are you sure you're not feeling sick? Wanna rest for a bit, to keep up with the appearance she tried to keep her back straight, but looking prospectively, her pale face told otherwise. She didn't seem really fine. She told Lana that it was her first time at the school festival and she's been having fun too much before asking her to dress her up. The leaf-colored dress that Lana lent to Monica was originally designed for a child, but Lana's father had arranged a seamstress to alter the design and make some adjustments. He might have simplified the design of the upper dress, but the large lace on the chest part made it look classy and refined. On the lower part, a draped skirt flowed down with a big ribbon attached to the left waist, leaving an image of billowy waves with every step she took and it was beautiful. All of these aspects had made the dress looks cute yet not childish. Showing its gorgeousness but not extravagant. With every part of the design had been calculated to the minute details, it had produced the dress that even Monica, who's not familiar with this kind of thing, could honestly say it suited her very well. To make it better, Lana also tied a ribbon in the same color as her dress and braided it together with Monica's hair. After braiding it to the side, she loosened some of it. Comma are you planning on something with that part, he? You can expect something on this. Lana smiled complacently before twirling the loosened part and binding it with a hairpin. Once the whole thing was in place, the organized hair turned into the shape of a flower. It's beautiful. My hair looks like a flower. This hairstyle is on the hit these days. Even Lana's hairstyle which she proudly displayed had been arranged in the same style as Monica's. It made Monica grin unconsciously. Comma he, we've got the same hairstyle, I I guess we might look like sisters, yeah, eh he, the hairstyle Lana had arranged will look good even without the hairpin, if anything, it was her skillful hands that made it so gorgeous. To finish it off, Lana applied makeup to Monica's face which was more glamorous than during the chess tournament, then pinned a white rose ornament to her chest. The simple design on the upper part of the dress made the white rose ornament look more distinct against the leaf-colored fabric. And Lord Cyril would be delighted too, added Lana as she closed the makeup kit as Monica wandered in puzzlement. Why would Lord Cyril be delighted? If she dressed up properly, she wouldn't embarrass the student council. And Lord Cyril will be delighted too. While Monica convinced herself so, Lana looked at the white rose ornament and smirked. Do your best, oh okay, Elian Hyatt had prepared a new dress just for today's ball. The fluffy pink dress, which was tailored by a renowned seamstress, brought out her dainty and delicate charm to the fullest. With her downy, light brown hair beautifully groomed and a flower ornament was attached to it. Making her beauty was comparable to a fairy queen, or so what the servants praised. Naturally, once Elian stepped into the venue, everyone will pay attention to Elian. Still, the ball feels more delightful when Miss Graham comes. Miss Ashley is so beautiful today, too. Her presence alone makes the atmosphere around her like a different world. Her hands quivered when she heard these comments. Following people's gazes. What came first into her view was the secretary of the student council, Bridget Graham chatting amicably with the guests. She wore a maroon-colored dress interwoven with gold and silver threads, a dress which not many people can wear but it suited her perfectly. And the most eye-catching thing about her was her glamorous beauty and her beautiful golden curly hair, 
which matched her gorgeous dress. The fact that she didn't look vulgar even when wearing such a fancy dress was probably due to her refined and dignified behavior. Especially her ability to grasp the identity and background of the guest to tailor the conversation to their interest. It was not something anyone can imitate. Following that, there's a girl with a listless look leaned back on the sofa for a rest. She was the daughter of Marcus Hyen, Claudia Ashley. The royal blue dress she wore elegantly accentuated the lines of her slender body. Her lustrous black hair was beautifully tied up and held in a large hair ornament, with a single strand hanging down from the side. Even that strand of hair looked beautiful, perhaps because of her mysterious beauty. She sat there with a doll-like expressionless face, but when she's moving or blinked just a little, the young men around her looked at her passionately, as if they were expecting something. Even at the glamorous evening party, both Bridget and Claudia's beauty stood out. Elian is one of the three most beautiful girls in the school, along with Bridget and Claudia. However, when comparing their beauty, people always place her beneath the two. She can't escape the frame of being an adorable young lady. In the first place, the only reason she was selected as the three most beautiful young ladies in the academy was her background as the same family as Felix's which made her popularity rise. So what? Family background and characters also can become aspects to evaluate a young lady. I come from a nobler family than any of them and my behavior is also not inferior to theirs. For example, when Elian smiled, the young men around her immediately smitten over and came to gather around her. She's just like a spring fairy in the book. How lovely she can be. Just looking at her charm almost made me have a heart attack. Feeling better at such words, Elian took a side glance at Felix. She easily spotted Felix's figure. As he has a more overwhelming presence than anyone else in the venue. It was not difficult to find him. She would have liked to approach Felix and ask his thought on her dress, but he was still talking with the teachers. It would have been unbecoming of a young lady to interfere forcibly here. The right choice was to approach Felix discreetly and naturally, then wait for him to call to her first. After all, Elian is the most suitable partner for Felix and would never be ignored by him. What is that? There's a group of young ladies gathered at the table in the back, surrounding a certain young man. That young man was Glenn Dudley, who played the hero Ralph in today's play. His tall figure and copper hair could easily be spotted even when surrounded by a group of young ladies. Apparently, his successful debut at the play had piqued the interest of numerous young ladies. Oh my, 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 what's so great about that crude and vulgar man? I feel pity for these young ladies who are not suited to be Felix's partner. Even Elian was inwardly making fun of the young ladies who were fawning over Glenn, she still paid attention to their conversation. The ladies were full of praise for today's play, and in between, they were inquiring about Glenn. And one of those ladies asked Glenn shyly in the enraptured face. Lord Dudley, I heard that you are a disciple of the Seven Sages. The barrier magician, is that true? That's right, www what did he say? She has never heard any of it. Glenn Dudley was a transfer student in the second year of high school, and his unaristocratic behavior has made him stand out from the crowd. However, perhaps because of his friendly personality, he seems to have a certain amount of interaction with some of the students. In Elian's opinion, Glenn Dudley was a delinquent who does not belong at Serendia Academy. And yet, for some reason, he was mingling with some of the student council members. Furthermore, Felix has taken an interest in him. A disciple of Seven Sages? From the rumor, Sir Barrier Magician is very popular and influential in noble circles. Becoming a Seven Sage means his status will be raised to account rank and more importantly. He will become His Majesty King's Counselor, and it's the highest authority a person could achieve. And will Glenn Dudley follow his step too, I wonder? Ignoring half the praises of the young ladies, she turned her attention to the conversation Glenn had with the others. You look so good in that suit, Lord Dudley, eh he, 
Just for your information, my master had specially arranged this suit for me. In fact, everyone could tell that the suit he wore was made by a first-class tailor. Even the slim jacket, which was trendy in terms of collar shape and silhouette, suited his long arms and legs very well. His master, Louis Miller, was well known for his fashion sense among ladies in noble circles. As a result, Glenn's formal wear was very sophisticated. It's a shame his sticking out copper hair hadn't been arranged neatly, but among these young men, Glenn Dudley had a presence that didn't lose to Felix's, though it's more because of his large figure and loud voice, and one of these young ladies asked Glenn timidly. Have you decided who you're going to dance with, Lord Dudley? Hmm, I'm not that good at dancing. I guess I'll satisfy my stomach and eat many dishes for now. You're so funny, Lord Dudley. The ladies seemed to be having fun, even after hearing Glenn's free-spirited response. This time, another lady asked jokingly. Could you tell us what type of girl do you like, Lord Dudley? Well, I'd love to hear about it. Please tell us, I'd like to hear it too. Elian focused all her attention. Glenn folded his arms and pondered seriously, letting his gaze wander through the air then opened his mouth. Comma a girl like Amelia, I guess, Amelia, the wife of the founder King Ralph, a role played by Elian. His words were like saying that he adores Elian who played Amelia. Oh, my if you had said that in front of me, I would have told you that I adore Felix more than Ralph. While Elian has these nasty thoughts, Glenn continued with his words. Ever since I read the story of the founder King as a child. I've always liked a collected woman like Amelia. She's cool, good at her job, and while she will tell you directly when you did something wrong, she will also listen to your problems seriously, and when you're hurt, she might say well, it can't be helped, but she'll take care of you in the end. Preferably older than me, Elian unconsciously gaped her mouth open. That's unexpected. All the aspects he had provided were the exact opposite of Elian's in every way. As information, Elian was in her first year in the advanced course, so she was younger than Glenn. When Elian hurriedly covered her almost retracted expression with a fan, the young men around her asked, Are you not feeling well? But she quickly put on a lovely smile and looked up at them. I apologize for making all of you worried. It just... I felt so embarrassed to be praised so much, said Elian with a smile, and everybody around her smitten over in delight. This is how it should be. If anything, the one who didn't have a good eye was Glenn Dudley. Even when he had performed on the stage with a lovely lady like her, he hadn't said hello to her, let alone complimented her. How about giving her a greeting, and maybe with some praise? If so, she might praise him for having a good eye. As if Elian's thoughts had been transmitted over, Glenn turned his gaze and looked toward Elian. And of course, Elian had never intended to approach him. Even he approached her, she won't call him out first. While Elian had these thoughts, Glenn approached her quickly with a large stride, but he briskly walked past her and called out to a small girl standing near the entrance. I knew it. It's you. Monica. Hey, Monica, oh, Dudley. Good evening, good evening. Your dress looks so lovely. It suits you perfectly, T thank, you. Ahelian unconsciously lifted down her fan, and the young men around her called out to her with concern, only to be ignored in vain. While anger emitted within her blue-gray pupils, Elian stared quietly at Glenn Dudley and Monica. If it had come to this, she could care less with her etiquette as a young lady anymore. So she walked over toward Felix with a rapid pace, and after confirming his chat with the teachers was over, she called out to him. Lord Felix, would you like to have a dance with me? V9C15, looking for a person as a Earth GT silent which December 1st, 2021 8 minutes Monica was talking to Glenn at the moment. During this time, she glimpsed some envy gazes from the people around her. Especially the young ladies who wanted to talk to Glenn. It must be the effect of his performance in the play. 
Remembering the applause and the uproar at the end of the performance, Monica smiled dryly inwardly. By the way, I don't see Lana with you today, well. We've arrived together up to the venue's entrance, but she said, I may become a hindrance if I'm here, so, then parted away with me, a hindrance? Whom she's going to be a hindrance to, I wonder, I'm not sure, remembering Lana's meaningful smile. Monica could only tilt her head in confusion. Since mulling over this question any further would not produce any result, Monica simply gave up thinking about it. Speaking of your dress, it looks very good on you, he he. Actually this dress was prepared by my master, did Lou, Lord Barrier Magician really prepare it for you? Monica almost inadvertently said Louis Boat corrected herself immediately. And Glenn himself didn't know that Monica's true identity nor her relationship was Lewis' colleague. He's so devoted to his job. In fact, the shoes she was wearing now were prepared by Lewis Miller. But when considering how he's been acted, witnessing how devoted he was to even preparing his pupil's formal dress and Monica's shoes, it made her feel discomfort. I've also asked this to my master, can I really get such a fine dress but he only said. It's provided, I wonder what did he mean by provided? Does the Seven Sages payment also cover his pupils' clothes as well, eh ha ha, most likely, what he meant by provided was referring to the necessary expenses for the Second Prince's escort mission. Monica's entrance fees also paid from there. Since Glenn was also sent to the Serendia Academy as a distraction to help Monica's enrollment, its expenses were treated as necessary and any payments involving Glenn's needs were a necessary expense. Wait, isn't this mission a direct order from His Majesty? Didn't that mean Lewis Miller imposed the king for the cost of his apprentice's formal dress? Then, if these shoes were like that too. Monica who has realized it's too late paled instantly. Judging how forward Lewis Miller's personality was, he sure will claim all of these expenses were necessary even if the other party he's dealing with was the king. I think. I have accepted something outrageous. While Monica inadvertently squirmed her feet, Glenn looked behind her then exclaimed. Lured by his sudden voice, Monica also followed his gaze. Then she saw Cyril Ashley in his formal dress, walking quickly toward them as he looking for something. The expression on his face seemed to be in a bit of a hurry. Did some trouble happen? What's up? Vice President. Got some trouble, him? So it's you too, Glenn Dudley and Treasurer Norton. As you can see, I can't find the conductor of the orchestra, have you seen him around here, now that he mentioned it, it's about the time for the Bulls dance to start. From Cyril's story, the conductor had gone to the washroom but seemed to lose his way here, so they couldn't perform the orchestra. Needing her fingers. Monica asked Cyril. You um, do you know what that person looks like? He is about the same height as me. He is over 50 and a little overweight. Gray hair with curls at the ends. He wore a black formal dress. You um, do you know how the size of his legs and arms? Maybe if you know the exact size of some parts of his face, I could increase my accuracy. How can I know that? Wait, what do you mean by accuracy? Hey, without answering Cyril's question, Monica cast a farsight spell without chanting. This spell allowed her to see far into the distance, yet because of her short height, her vision was obstructed by people's figures, making it difficult to see far away. MMM, looking at Monica who was doing a tiptoe, Glenn, as he had realized something, put his hands under Monica's armpits and lifted her small body. What are you doing? If I do this, she can see farther. Monica, did you find the conductor? To be carried up by Glenn like this was a little, no, it was really embarrassing. Even so, it allowed her to see around farther. Monica can accurately determine a person's height and the length of their limbs just by looking at them. There might be some distance, but it's possible to accurately calculate a person's size by estimating the height Glenn had lifted her the distance between them, and its angle. While being lifted up by Glenn, Monica looked around in a circle, 
then opened her mouth while keeping her gaze fixed on someone. Comma I found three men who fit the description. The first person has his hair tied back. The second person has an aquiline nose. The third person has a lady next to him. The second person's arms are slightly different in length on each side, so I think he might have been playing some kind of instrument. Does the aquiline-nosed man wear a pin on his lapel? He should have been wearing one if he's a member of the orchestra. A normal person would be unable to see him from this distance, but Monica, who was using a farsight spell could see it clearly. After adjusting her spell to focus on his lapel, she saw a violin-like pin attached to it. After she told Cyril what she saw, he said, It's him, and nodded in confirmation. Thanks, but can I ask you to guide me to this person's position? S. Shutter. After thanking Glenn for lifting her up, Monica guided Cyril to the conductor's position. Considering how far their distance to the conductor, Cyril inadvertently blurted out, Are you really able to see him at this distance? in a mutter. But since she can't honestly say that she's using a farsight spell, she only gave him a vague smile and gave an excuse. Why you see, I actually had good eyesight, and it was a total lie. While Monica mostly spent her time riding in a dark place, she actually had reasonably good eyesight. But it's unlikely for her sight to reach the end of the venue. Once Monica and Cyril arrived at the conductor's position, they led him to the where orchestra band was. After Cyril sure the orchestra started without a hitch, he patted his chest in relief. Comma thank you, you've been a big help this time, really. To tell the truth, we've arranged this orchestra bigger than usual, though, many unexpected problems occurred afterward, it's fine, but, wasn't it Lord Maywood's job to handle the orchestra matters, since virtually, all the matters related to the backstage of the ball were handled by Neil. Come to think of it, Cyril seemed to be helping Neil from the preparation stage. Could it be that there was some kind of trouble without Monica's awareness? You um, did some trouble happen in Lord Maywood's side? As should I provide him with some help? Oh, it's not like that. Cyril shook his head slowly and awkwardly darted his gaze around. Well. I want to give General Affairs Manager Maywood some free time, so I offered myself to take over his duties, as Monica tilted her head in puzzlement, a student who was in charge as a receptionist approached Cyril rapidly then whispered some words to his ear. Cyril's furrowed his thin brows and responded, All right, I'll be there right away. Cyril then looked at Monica's face and the flower ornament on her chest alternately, and for some reason. He looked depressed. Comma Treasurer Norton, can I ask you a favor? S. Shutter, what would it be? I just received a report that a problem appears at the receptionist desk. They don't have enough kitchen liaisons and it had to be dealt with immediately. So could I ask you to handle that role until a replacement student arrives? In most cases, the job of the kitchen liaison is to pass orders between the venue and the kitchen. While technically the waiter and the chef would communicate directly with each other, a liaison would be required to assist in preparing the necessary supplies and helping to alleviate the situation when both of them had too busy dealing with their orders. Up until now, Cyril had never assigned Monica with this kind of task. Considering how weak her physical was, he always assigned her a behind-the-desk chore involving numbers. And that's why Cyril felt anxious about it. And Monica also felt that way. If it was her usual self she would say, I, I can't while shaking her head. But right now, I had this charm with me. Monica looked at the white rose ornament, the charm Cyril had given to her to prevent her from embarrassment, which had been arranged on her chest. After burning that image into her mind, she lifted her face up. Comma I, I will do it. Cyril looked at her wryly. He's probably had a mixed feeling when hearing Monica's answer. Since Monica's fear of strangers had seeped deep into her bone, he must be worried to leave this task to her. Comma if nothing happens, you will only need to stand by there. But, if some troubles occurred, contact me immediately. Oh okay, Lord Felix, would you like to have a dance with me? 
called out Elian, and Felix responded with a gentle smile as he stretched out his hand. I would be happy to, right after that exchange, the music started. Smiling sweetly at her, Felix invited her into the dance hall. All eyes were immediately drawn to them when they took each other's hand and started to dance. The sight of the handsome prince and beautiful duke's daughter was dancing together had enthralled everybody in the hall. As the two figures performed their perfect dance moves, their gazes swept over their surroundings for a brief moment before they shifted directions. Elian was looking for Glenn's figure and found him munching on some meat at the light meal table. Of course, he didn't pay attention to the dance hall. As for Felix, he was looking for Monica's figure. He caught the sight of her talking some matter with Cyril. And of course, she also didn't pay attention to the dance hall. Oh my, oh my, oh my, you sure have some nerve to be more interested in eating than looking in my direction? Look at me and be envious, Glenn Dudley. In fact, you should have been sucking your thumb while seeing my graceful dance with Lord Felix, and don't just keep eating those meats. Elian, Monica didn't seem to understand the meaning of the flower ornament. Well, I know Cyril gave her that flower ornament under the pretense of a charm without telling her its meaning was to keep her away from the other men but isn't a bit unfair to have a dance with Monica for yourself? Felix, hey, look at my dance with Lord Felix. Why not you look in my direction and put that attention of yours here? Elian, I'm sure she couldn't care less about me dancing with someone, though I knew that. But, aren't we buddies who spent one night together not long ago? I wish you could be more concerned about it. Felix, once again, Felix and Elian looked at each other, giving impeccable and perfect smiles. It's like having my dream come true to be able to dance with you like this, your highness, it would be my honor, they might be showing their beautiful smile at each other, but their minds were, in fact, in another place. V9 C16, I belong to you as Earth GT Silent which December 11th, 2021 7 minutes Claudia Ashley was leaning back on the sofa and letting her gloomy air spread around her. The gloominess was so overwhelming that if she said that there had been misfortune in her family today, people might inadvertently believe her. However, no matter how much gloom she spreads, her perfect beauty remained intact. Especially in the eyes of men who are blinded by love, her gloomy appearance seems to be languid and fleeting. Miss Claudia, would you please accept my rose? The man who knelt in front of Claudia and offered her a rose ornament was the ninth who tried his luck today. Claudia let out a sigh behind her fan. Comma it's almost double digits, yes, it was the number of flowers she had thrown into the trash bin. Claudia lifted herself up slowly from leaning on the armrest and stared at the red rose that was offered to her. Comma I do like flowers. This rose is a new variant with a strong fragrance we've cultivated in our home. And I've chosen this flower just for you, it sure has a good fragrance, a thin smile plastered on her doll-like face. When the people of her surroundings saw it, they were mesmerized and exhaled in adoration, that's how beautiful she was. And such a beautiful young lady with her smile still exposed on her face told the man who offered her the flower. Come but. I have no desire to wear such strong fragrance flower, the man's face tensed up. The people who were listening to this exchange couldn't stand it any longer and started chuckling. Such exchange normally would have broken most people's hearts, but the ninth challenger was quite persistent. Our family, Marcus Gringham, has a close relationship with Marcus Hyen, that was three generations ago. I've been hoping to have a long chat with Miss Claudia for some time now, if you want a connection to the Marcus of Hyen, you should probably go talk to my brother, no, what I'm interested in is you, Miss Claudia. I've never seen a woman as beautiful as you, when the man looked at Claudia with passionate eyes, Claudia narrowed her lapis lazuli eyes and covered her mouth with a fan. Come well. It's amazing how a man with limited knowledge can say that every time he meets a new woman, in this lively venue, only the area around the sofa where Claudia was sitting was enveloped in a chilly atmosphere. 
As the man fell silent, Amada's voice called out from behind him, Um, excuse me. The man turned around to see a small boy in formal attire, Neil Clay Maywood, standing there looking rather awkward. Claudia looked at Neil impassively. Kama did something, happen, and no, I just, well, Neil gave a lame cough and held out his right hand, which had been hidden behind his back, in front of Claudia. In his hand was a flower ornament of orange roses with a brown ribbon. Claudia widened her eyes and Neil scratched his cheek in embarrassment. Would you like to dance with me? It took Claudia a few seconds to swallow the meaning of Neil's words. It wasn't that she was trying to ridicule him. The words really got stuck in her throat and didn't come out right away. Comma that Rose was supposed to be given her head as a token of someone has been taken, not right before the dance, instead of I'm so happy, I'm so delighted. The words that came out from her mouth were far from such cute words. But Neil didn't seem bothered, in fact, he lowered his eyebrows apologetically. I am sorry. I thought it would be rude to you when I was not sure if I'll have time to dance to give you the kind of token, Neil said exactly what Cyril had expected him to say. Claudia's widened eyes narrowed then put a soft smile on her face. Kama can you put that flower ornament on me? Yes, Neil stood in front of the seated Claudia and bent down to fasten the flower ornament on the chest of her royal blue dress. He was very careful not to touch Claudia's body, which was typical of a sincere man. When he finished fastening the roses, Neil lowered his eyebrows in a troubled manner. I should have used white roses to match today's blue dress. I'm sorry, for choosing my favorite color, but I like it, even at a time like this. He was more concerned about what would look good on Claudia than dyeing it to his own colors. I wish you could have dyed me in your colors more. Claudia wants Neil to fixate on the fact that she belongs to him. She wants to show it to everyone around her. So Claudia would proudly show off the rose, the proof of reservation, to the people around her that, I belong to Neil. Claudia held out her hand, and Neil took it in a very natural motion. Standing side by side, Claudia was somewhat taller than him. Claudia has chosen to wear low-heeled shoes, but the height difference was still obvious to everyone. Kama I thought you didn't want to dance with a taller woman, what? S sorry if I'm too small for you, Miss Claudia, but it's hard for you to dance, isn't it please let me know if it's getting burdensome, okay, see, even at a time like this. Neil can't help but care about Claudia. What a hateful, adorable, and lovable person. Comma I could dance all day long, you know, ah, but I don't think it would possible. She stared at Neil with a bit of bitterness as he answered immediately, and he said with a wry smile. Vice President Ashley had volunteered himself to take over my job. I've been meeting with him since this morning for that purpose. Ah. He told me not to tell this to you. I am sorry, could you keep this secret from him? Claudia then scanned her eyes around to find Cyril's figure, but he's not there. He's probably running around behind the scenes to take over Neil's job. It's just like that of a stepbrother who put himself on the back burner. In spite of your block-headed head, you still put a concern in a weird way. It made me hate myself. With this. She had to pay that debt someday. Preferably, she would repay it in a way that her stepbrother would be grateful in a reluctant face. Monica, who had been entrusted with the role of liaison between the kitchen and the serving staff, opened the kitchen door, her face tense with tension. The atmosphere in the kitchen was even more intense than at a party, with chefs working busily. As should I greet them? What will they think if they saw a girl in a dress come suddenly? Maybe if I introduce myself, they will understand, but, they looked so busy. Although she had the courage to open the door, it was difficult to take a step forward from there. In addition, talking to the busy people working there was an extremely high barrier for a shy person like her. I'm going to say it, I will say it, but it has to be at the right timing, wait. When is the right timing? As Monica was pondering over this, a cook with a big figure looked at her and shouted. 
What's the matter, little girl? Are you lost? And new? W.L. S. Student Council has appointed me to be a liaison here, said Monica in a faint voice, and the cook's face lit up. Oh. You've got the right timing. The weather is quite good, right? Why yeah, because of that, the ice as we used to cool the ice cream was melted. So I need you to get the vice president to make some ice for me. Cyril might have said that she only just have to stand by there if nothing happened, but perhaps, it's only her wishful thinking that it will end without anything happening. The cook held out a large basin to Monica. Its size was big enough for two grown men to hold hands and form a circle. We need it this much. I count this on you, so he asked her. After holding out her hands to the limits to receive the basin, she walked over to the hallway. Since the ices they asked for are magically made, it means that they only need it for cooling purposes, not to consume. I guess. Ice made by magic contains mana which is not suitable to consume. If it's consumed excessively, especially by people who are not resistant to mana, it can cause mana poisoning. But, if it's only to be used for cooling ice creams from the outside, even using magically made ices, it would pose no problem. The cook was probably planning to rely on Cyril, who was good at ice spell, but Cyril was busy. If possible, she doesn't want to bother him with another trouble. Holding a basin in her hands, Monica exhaled through her nose and moved to the end corridor where fewer people were around. Then, with no chanting magic, she created a full tray of ices. By eliminating impurities and increasing the quantity of mana, she was able to produce beautiful clear ices which were harder to melt. It's done. After nodding in satisfaction, Monica tried to lift the basin, but... Ugh. She just realized the basin was too heavy to lift. She just made a careless mistake that would make people doubt her title of genius. Monica struggled for a while but eventually gave up trying to lift the basin, so she crouched down and pushed it with both hands. Looking at Monica crouched down in her dress to push the basin, some young ladies passed by snickered. Oh my, what a sight, she's just like cattle, how disgraceful. I don't think the guests would like to see that sight, said the young ladies mockingly, but those words didn't pass through to the struggling Monica. Just a little bit, just for a little bit, so said Monica told herself as she pushed the basin, eventually, she saw the kitchen's door. In her ragged breaths, she kept pushing the basin, but, sudden dizziness came struck instantly. Ah! After fighting the intruder and being poisoned. Her body had not yet recovered to the point where she could do some physical task. Her head throbbed in pain and her vision went whirling. I can't. I can't collapse here. I still haven't done. Monica's fingers which held the basin slipped off and her small body lost its strength before she collapsed to the floor. As her skin paled, her consciousness washed away. I still haven't done my task. V9 C18 the happiness of a hero who became a star as a GT silent which December 13, 2021 11 minutes Cyril sat Monica down on the couch and picked up a blanket that had fallen to the floor to drape it over her shoulders. I'll be heading back to my work soon, but until you're feeling better, you should stay here and rest, I, I will, and, um, thank you for everything, Monica was trying to be helpful, but instead, she was being helped. And when she thought that Cyril had taken care of all this for Monica, her heart was filled with a sense of guilt. But Cyril, as he typically did, lifted his chin haughtily and snorted. As his highness right-hand man, this is nothing much of a problem for me. Soon, General Affairs Manager Maywood will be back, thus, the side of his chest outstretched and his chin lifted sharply, made her think, ah. It's the usual Lord Cyril, and strangely reassured Monica even more. When she first met him, she felt intimidated by Cyril's haughty behavior, but lately, looking at his proud manner only makes her feel strangely at ease instead. Lord Cyril, um, what is it, 
Monica pinched the ribbon that hung from the flower ornament on her chest and bit her lip tightly. She really wanted to thank Cyril before he went back to continue his job. Kama thank you very much for giving me this charm. Thanks to it, I was able to work harder than usual today. The always cold eyes of Cyril softened slightly. A small smile crept onto the edges of his lips. I see, murmuring as if chewing on something, Cyril walked out of the room. As she listened to the sound of the door quietly closing, Monica tightly squeezed the blanket over her shoulders. Her dizziness had subsided considerably, but it would be better to rest a little while longer since she had just collapsed not long ago. For no particular reason, Monica looked out the window and let out a sigh of admiration at the stars twinkling in the night sky. Probably by now, Lady Star Oracle Witch was looking up at the night sky and predicting the future of this country. Come to think of it, I wonder what Lady Star Oracle Witch was referring to when she said, I've been foreseeing many futures of the kingdom, especially on the royal family, but for the past ten years, I've been unable to read His Highness Felix's destiny, Star Oracle Witch was unable to foresee Felix's destiny. For some time now, there has been a series of major incidents around Felix. An assassination attempt by Casey, an intruder at a chess tournament, and today, an assassin named Yuan has reappeared. Every single one of them was a major incident. And yet, the Star Oracle WH was unable to foresee any of these incidents. I am also curious about what that Yuan guy said, if his goal was not to assassinate His Highness. Then why did he intrude into the school? What Yuan said was, Yeah, I've confirmed it at a close range after pretending to be getting rid of a spider from him. It's the work of the traitor Arthur. That person's prediction was right at close range. What did Yuan confirm from Felix? Who is the traitor Arthur? Who is that person that Yuan talking about? The more she pondered, the more questions came flooding in. Leaning against the window sill, Monica gazed blankly at the twinkling stars. Somewhere on that star, is there a destiny for Felix? Kamala, Monica might unable to foresee Felix's destiny in the night sky, but she couldn't help but peel her eyes away when she spotted him by the tree just below her. W. Why would His Highness be in a place like that? As Monica's mouth opened and closed repeatedly, Felix looked around, and then, unexpectedly, he started to climb the tree in his formal wear. Wyatt, what is the star of this party planning to even have sneaking out of the party at this time? Whatever it was, it was something that Monica, as his secret guard, could not overlook. So Monica rushed out of the room and headed to Felix's place. Monica remembered the shape of the tree Felix had climbed, so when she walked out of the hall, she was able to find it right away. Upon closer inspection, she could see the honey blonde glowing in the moonlight through the leaves. Why your highness, Monica looked up at the tree and called out to him, and the leaves rustled and swayed. You are still very good at finding me, aren't you? Felix looked down at Monica from the top of the tree and chuckled, then he lightly jumped down from the tree and landed in front of her. Monica was anxious. Wondering if it was safe for him to jump down from such a high place, but Felix looked nonchalant and picked the leaves from his hair with his fingertips. You um, what about the party? I just wanted to get some fresh air. If you want to get some fresh air, why would you need to climb a tree? Monica asked fearfully, but Felix laughed in a mischievous way. It's the laugh he showed when he was in the entertainment district. I just want to see some stars. Because it's looked beautiful today, are you fond of the stars? Not really, Felix denied it easily and looked up at the stars above him squinting. I wasn't that interested in it at the beginning, but my friend was very knowledgeable about it, you see. So, the more he told me about it, the more I became familiar with it. Maybe that's why I feel like going outside when I see the stars. Felix took Monica's hand in a very natural gesture and put his other hand on her waist. It was as if they were about to start dancing. Um, your highness, I think you should back to the ball, just hang out with me for a while. I mean, 
You sure would refuse my invitation if we're in the hall. He's right. So Monica decided to be quiet and let Felix take the lead. Rather than dancing, it was more like just strolling along to the music. Even though Monica's steps were messed up and she didn't get her turn, Felix didn't seem to mind. In fact, he seemed to be enjoying it. It reminds me of the time I taught you to dance. At that time, you were thinking about embroidering in my scarf, weren't you? Uh, um, well, it's about a theorem applying the scarf pattern, to be exact. Then, I suppose you don't remember anything I said to you back then, do you? Once again, he was right on the spot, so Monica kept her silent. Felix chuckled meanly and brought his lips to Monica's ear. You look pretty good in that dress. It's dainty, yet subtly gorgeous, and it seems to bring out your charm. I knew a green dress would suit you very well. Right, dark green color like a forest can be wonderful, but the color of young leaves in spring looks lovely too. Well, uh, thank you. Being complimented on the dress made her feel embarrassed, but she was also honestly happy. It was like he was praising Lana who'd prepared this dress for her. Your hair is pretty, too. Did your friend do the flowery hairdo for you? Yes, Lana and I have matching hairstyles. Looking at Monica smiled bashfully, Felix lifted the edge of his lips slightly, formed a dispirited smile. Comma how envious, eh? The hand that held Monica's waist strengthened. The music was still going on, but the steps stopped. Felix's blue, gleaming eyes looked somewhat inorganically at the flower ornament on Monica's chest. He then reached out his hand to Monica's neck, traced a line down Monica's neck with his fingertips, while keeping his other hand on her waist. Comma I gave you that peridot necklace, but you never wore it. Monica's body jumped involuntarily at the low voice that shivered in her ears. Now Monica realized why Felix had been so concerned about her neck during the day. His voice sounded somewhat sulky, just like he did at night. Comma Eglum, I'm not yet skilled in fashion, so, nevertheless, I wanted to see you wearing that necklace. Felix's words were as if he were jealous of Lana who gave her a floral hairdo and Cyril who gave a floral ornament. And she thought it was impossible. Confusion filled Monica's eyes, and strangely, the stare that Felix gave to Monica filled with passion. The brilliance of a jewel and the brilliance of a star are very similar. If the peridot had been shining around your neck, I would have admired you more than the shooting stars in the night sky, as the sweet. Well, a groomed face stared at her at close range, Monica's eyes whirled around as she struggled to think and squeeze out the words. WWW, what is it? What's made a shooting star can shine so beautifully is because they are moving unbelievably fast for it to travel from one country to another within one second, even it only has the size of a small pebble. Objects moving at high speed would emit light when they collide with the tiny atoms and molecules in the night sky which is much different from the principle of shining jewels. In the first place, jewels do not emit light from within themselves, unless they have magical power added to them, but rather by reflecting light, Felix put his hand over his mouth and shuddered. His throat quivered, before letting out a breathy laugh. Although he didn't understand exactly what was being said, the words she said to him has really tickled him. I see you are familiar not only with numbers but also with stars. Well, Monica doesn't specialize in astronomy, but she has been calculating the orbits of stars at the request of the star oracle which. So, she had a good amount of basic knowledge about astronomy. Comma if you delve deeper in biology subject, you will find many aspects in it only composed of a minuscule number which accumulated to add up with each other. While astronomy is all about calculating huge numbers which much bigger than the national budget. Well, they're both very interesting, mathematically speaking. Do you want to be a scholar in the future, I wonder, trailed off Monica at Felix's question and smiled vaguely. Monica has never dreamed of being anything else in her life. Not knowing what she wanted to be while frightened by people, she lived her life in a state of flux until she realized she had become the seven sages.
After becoming one of the seven sages, she had been slaying dragons and doing calculations that other seven sages had asked her to do, but her main focus was still on researching magic formulas. In that sense, Monica can already be said to be a researcher of magic. And probably the best in the country. But she kept quiet, not telling Felix about it, to which he responded in a sincere manner. If you have a particular path you wish to pursue, I can talk to Count Kerbeck for you. Monica's eyes widened at Felix's suggestion and she shook her head in panic. And no, I am fine. Do you know what happens to girls who graduate from Sarandia Academy? To the puzzled Monica, Felix told her. They will be married too. The students of Sarandia Academy were all children of noble families, so it was quite natural for them to be married. Moreover, they can't choose who they want to marry. Have you ever thought about marrying someone? Monica responded immediately to Felix's question. No, that much was for certain and she denied it definitively. For a witch who doesn't know love nor romance, moreover a one who is always frightened of people, will she have a future where she can build a warm family? Maybe, after she leaves Serendia Academy. She will return to the days of hiding in a mountain cabin where she lives only facing numbers and magic formulas while holding these memories in Sarandia Academy like treasures. As Monica looked down with vacant eyes, Felix took Monica's hand gently. Lifting up her face to face Felix, she blinked when saw Felix looking at her with a warm gaze. Which smile is he showing now? Is it his highness or eggs? But... Without answering Monica's puzzling face, he told her. A long ago, my friend had told me some words, I wish you could find many things you would be obsessed with that you like, you enjoy, not for anyone else, but for yourself he had said those words when they walked through the entertainment district before. For that reason, he's looking for something you can enjoy, something you can be passionate about. Perhaps I don't have much freedom left. I hope you can carry on this wish, Monica felt a kind of resignation at those words, and thought, the person standing before her must be Eeg. Then, what about you, Eeg, he is going to give up his friend's words that he has been holding in his heart for a long time, leaving all the wishes in those words to Monica. The moment she realized that, for the first time, Monica felt a kind of insecurity about this young man in front of her. D didn't the friend of yours tell you to find something you like to do? A are you going to, stop looking for it? When Monica spoke awkwardly, Felix lowered his eyebrows and smiled somewhat sadly. Dot. I have a wish that I must fulfill, even if I have to break my friend's promise. With that, Felix turned his gaze away from Monica and looked up at the night sky. Do you see the two large stars over there that connected in a trapezoidal shape? It's a constellation of the hero Ralph. It said when he was on the verge of dying, he was afraid that people will forget about him. So his wife, Amelia, asked the spirit king of darkness, Eldira, to create a constellation for the dying Ralph. So when people gazing upon the starry sky and saw those stars, they would immediately think about him. Why are we suddenly talking about mythology? She thought Felix was changing the topic to avoid answering her question, but Monica's intuition whispered that it was not the case. And Monica probably has touched something around his true feelings which probably caused the young man before her to speak like that. Looking up at the hero star, Felix's eyes were somewhat tranquil, as if he were dreaming. Comma even in his death, the hero Ralph still leaves something to us in the brilliant night. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we can leave something like that as well? Monica's hair stood on end. Felix was always smiling calmly and gently. When he called himself Eek, he seemed easygoing and rarely showed any attachment to anything. Even when he was called a puppet of Duke Crockford, he still behaved like an exemplary prince. But in the eyes of the young man who was now looking up at the stars in front of her, there was a definite flame of obsession and she felt a firm belief in madness deep-rooted within. But when Felix turned back his gaze from the starry stars to Monica, he had the usual smile which was warm and gentle. 
I think it's getting cold here. Shall we go back inside? All the sweet voices and gentle smiles showed outside only to mask his true feeling inside. Perhaps, even she pressed the matter more, it wouldn't touch his true feeling anymore. After nodding with her pale face, Monica followed behind the walking Felix.